Yes, madam, we can go ahead. We are live now. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. Sorry for the delay. There was some te technical uh, problem there. So, welcome to this joint meeting of Clinical Research Committee of ISOPAR with uh, CEFOG on a very important uh, global problem that is placental accreta spectrum syndrome. And uh, I'm really grateful to Dr. Uh, Alpesh Gandhi, uh, President Foxy, who gave us this opportunity to go ahead with this program. And he being an expert on the critical hospital management, uh, he would have been, uh, we would have been really honored to have him here, but today, because we know he's so busy, he has not been able to join us so far. Uh, so um, my next very special guest is no other than the president of the CEFOC, Professor Pardosi Begum, Madam. Uh, welcome, Madam. And, you know, we're really honored to have you here. Uh, she's uh, from Bangladesh. And uh, can I have her introductory slide? Uh, she is professor and head of the department, Ibrahim Medical College, Birdham Hospital in Dhaka. She is also the president-elect of the Bangladesh Obzingaini Society. She is member of the technical advisory group for uh, you know, technical quality improvement with the Ministry of uh, Health and Family Welfare. And she is also involved in so many FIGO projects. So, Madam, welcome. We're really honored to have you here. And as a chief guest, we would like the opening uh, few lines from you, Madam. Dr. Pirdosi. Thank you. Um, I... First of all, I'm on this gathering. Dr. Alpish Gandhi is not here, President of Foxy. Um, the chairperson of this uh, research committee of Foxy, Dr. Sarna Desai, uh, the support representative uh, from Foxy, and all the dignitaries, and my very old friend, Dr. Milin Shah. Uh, so, um, uh, thanks everyone for uh, very, uh, inviting us, and fortunately, we will be able to join all, all of you. Basically, uh, placenta accretor syndrome is a, I should say it's a nightmare for domestic patients um, because uh, the, the causes are many basically, but with the increase in rate of surgery, especially in our area, in uh, Safa region, I should say the rate varies from our official is 23% all over the country. So it's around everywhere like that, but in private many private hospitals and big institutions that it is much much higher and consequently the placenta previa is uh, stop sharing, stop uh, common and placenta accreta common and also the cesarean scar pregnancy itself it's not only the placenta previa accreta we face this in even early pregnancy is lots of complications so this is important and and the perspective of uh, Saving women's life, lots of blood transfusion. This patient needs massive blood transfusion, and with uh, so many complications: the bladder injury, um, renal failure, um, other urinary tract infection, hypovolemic shock, and death. Even in in some cities, the death is of pleasant abbreviate rate even thirty percent. So we need to uh, prevent this. We need to tackle this. We need to know how to. Uh, manage these situations and here not only the technical part, the clinical part, counseling the patient and there are so many things we need to address here. So I thank Dr. Meena and her team for organizing this very important meeting and we've been knowing many things, especially the juniors, I think the technique of doing this treatment and how to tackle this and also sometimes there's road off if we want to save the uterus, the will time for it is also important. So we'll be learning things. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Uh, thanks. Thank you, madam. And uh, from so the Foxy. Thanks to Professor Pardosi. And 
डॉक्टर पदवासी बेगम एंड आई एम डॉक्टर साधना गुप्ता नॉट साधना देसाई हु इज वन ऑफ द लेजेंड ऑफ पॉक्सी एंड साधना गुप्ता सो थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर जॉइनिंग एंड आई थिंक इन द कमिंग दिस ईयर वी विल कॉल मोर एंड मोर टू यू फॉर मेनी सच प्रोग्राम्स एंड वी रियली सीक फॉर योर इनपुट एंड योर लीडरशिप फॉर सच प्रोग्राम थैंक यू वेरी मच आई रो स्पेशल थैंक्स टू यू सो कैरी ऑन मीन प्लीज थैंक यू my special welcome to the foxy representative to sefog atna ta madam our chairpersons for today dr prasanita singh the vice president of um, foxy uh, then uh, we have um, again uh, dr fidosi madam i have just mentioned uh, another very important vice president from foxy dr ramani devi is here with us as one of the panelists may i also welcome our speakers dr alka pandey dr ag radhika and um, other panelists professor arup maji from kolkata uh, then we have dr melin shah from cholapur uh, then uh, then again uh, i think i myself am uh, one of the panelists uh, so and my co part my coordination will be done for this program by dr amita sena so now i request dr amita sena to take the scientific program ahead with the first lecture okay thank you dr meena for giving me this opportunity uh, at the outset i would like to say that a very uh, a very good afternoon to all of my senior faculties teachers and dear viewers Uh, it's proud moment for all of us that today Safog and Foxy stalwarts are here at the same platform. But without wasting much time, let's get started with the first session, which is very important. We have two interesting topics like cesarean scar pregnancy, and another one is uh, techniques techniques in advanced cases of placenta accreta. Uh, to chair this session, we have two esteemed chairpersons. One is Madam Fadosi Begum. from bangladesh and dr meena has just introduced her another chairperson is dr anita singh vice president foxy 2020 so to start with this session i request dr anita singh madam anita singh madam is ex professor patna medical college patna she is vice president foxy 2020 chief consultant jp hospital and jan chikitsa hospital patna madam has been organizing secretary aicog 2014 at patna she has been chairperson endocrinology committee foxy 2014 2016 she has also been governing council member of icog 2015 2020 madam is also president agoy bihar chapter and she is founder secretary of ifs bihar chapter now i request both the chairpersons to carry on the first session over to you madam madam please over to you madam i think she need to be unmuted yeah anita madam please unmute yourself hello madam amita. thank you amita yeah. most, uh, most welcome madam i wish to thank dr sadhna gupta and dr meena saman for having given me this opportunity to chair such an important session and i welcome the guests beyond our country that is dr firdosi begum and i am thankful to her that she has agreed to join us at this platform and share her knowledge and experience how they manage these difficult cases in their part of the world and uh, with this we are going to begin our first lecture that is going to be delivered by dr alka pande and she is from one of from amongst us we all know him but uh, just to know other people uh, she is assistant associate professor in the department of obstetrics and gynecology patna medical college she is national corresponding editor of jogi and she has she was chairperson practical obstetrics committee foxy from 2015 to 17 and she also backed the best committee prize during that period and she was president of patna obstetrics gynae society in the year 12 2012 to 14 and she was joint organizing secretary in the aicog that we conducted at 2014 at patna and she was uh, 
organizing chairperson of various conference conferences in the past that we have done both national and state level conferences and uh, she is a very good friend of mine and uh, for the sake of all of you to know that she is going to contest for vice president foxy this year from east jod so this is my humble appeal to all of you that please support her with these words i invite dr alka pande to deliver her lecture on a very important topic that is scar topic pregnancy dr alka please take up the stage anita madam we can't see you can you start your video my video is already on i think they have muted me or done something it's on anita's video is on yeah okay. <laughs> but i can't see madam oh you have to change the I think Dr. Milin can see me. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Dr. Alka Pandey needs to unmute herself and slide. Yeah, and she had to share her screen. She is not on the screen. Alka, please come on the screen. Sadna, you got Sadna, unmuted. Unmute. Uh, you need to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Now I can see Anita Di. Who is sharing the screen? Sadna, you got muted. You need to unmute. I think you are speaking I'm, something. I'm <laughs> yeah, correct. Actually, I am seeing what is the problem yes, with Dr. Yes. Alka Pandey. So actually, her screen was there before uh, two minutes before. I don't know. She already had. I think shared her screen. Can we go for Dr. Radhika talk? What's the? I mean, what's the problem with Dr. Kamande? Uh, yes, ma'am. Let me. Uh, but Amit, her screen was shared, na? Before this, I think Dr. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think she's busy. You unmute Alka, so we'll come to know. Yeah. Started, sir. Correct. I think we can start with Dr. Radhika. Yeah, but you need to unmute her. She's okay. still muted. Alka, please unmute yourself. So, Mina, why she is not able to? Uh, I'd say, uh, yeah, yeah. Welcome, ma'am. If there's some problem, I think Dr. Radhika can start. Yeah, I think she's calling someone. Most probably Meena. Yeah, correct. Unka phone hi raha hai. Ajoin thay you. You can ask Dr. Radhika to. Ah yes yes. Okay okay okay. Um, somebody else can share if she has some problem. I think uh, if if we have any difficulty with her, can we go for yes. the second speaker? Yes, yes. Hi, yeah. yes. I think so. So the second speaker um, is uh, Dr. A. G. Radhika. Um, she is from UCMS from Delhi, UCMS Delhi, and um, a renowned uh, obstetrician, of course. And we'll be hearing from her. About the hysterectomy technique in advanced grade placenta accretor spectrum. 
and I think this is of great interest for us. I'll request Dr. Radhika to start. Thank you. Also, she and she here is some of her uh, some of her credentials. She is the chairperson multi multidisciplinary committee (AOGD) and Foxy national coordinator for clinical research. She is also chairperson of skill workshop AOGD. Um, okay, so she is a great she has a great honor of Cochrane Northern and member of South Asian Cochrane Network. And uh, also she worked with WHO, ICMR, and many other organizations. And um, she is a very great honor speaker as well. So with this, I again invite Dr. Radhika to start her topic on the surgery on placenta previa activism. Thank you so much for the kind words, ma'am. Uh, very good afternoon to everybody. Um, yes. So very good afternoon to all. Uh, my uh, warm regards uh, to uh, Dr. Firdosi, uh, special regards to Dr. Sadna, all the uh, senior members of the panel group and all the faculty who are here, Dr. Anita, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramani Devi from South, and uh, Dr. Milincha and everybody else. And uh, a big hi to the, um, the audience who are here who have spared time to listen to us. So I am going to basically touch upon something extremely practical with increasing in, increase in the number of uh, cesarean sections uh, today, I think all of us would have come across various types of placenta accreta. So when I talk about the grading, when I when I say uh, uh, advanced grade placenta accreta spectrum, I wish to just brush up the uh, recently introduced uh, grading system of placenta accreta spectrum by FIGO. This was introduced in 2018. We are familiar with placenta accreta, increta, percreta, but what they did was they gave a grading so that everybody talks of the same language. You know, the, when I see something, I should be able to say it is grade one, grade two, grade three. And now, in fact, this has also undergone a certain modification, but the basic uh, foundation remains the same. And the second was to be able to audit the various practices. Those are uh, undertaken by way of managing the various grades. So uh, we are going to basically focus today on the advanced grade of placenta accreta spe spectrum, that is placenta percreta, with the uh, invasion into either the uh, bladder, that is grade 3B, or grade 3C, that is invasion into the other pelvic tissue or the viscera, along with uh, uh, it probably, you know, it, there is a possibility of invasion into the broad ligament, vaginal wall, pelvic side wall, with or without invasion of the bladder. So um, these are challenging uh, types of hysterectomies, and the uh, people have, if one is to, if one were to go through the literature, there is, there are very, there are many different types of procedures that have been advocated. So there are two interesting uh, types that I am going to basically talk about. So these are the various types, you know, one yes. might be able to, uh, one might have come across these various types of uh, advanced types of placenta accreta spectrum. There is something which has gone into the, uh, the broad ligament, these two into the bladder, and then again protruding, you know, bulging from the lower uterine segment. This was a very peculiar case that we had done a few months back. Uh, we had uh, placenta accreta, which was central placenta. And we decided to do expectant management. We left the placenta along the cord inside. She underwent uterine artery embolization only to present after six weeks in the emergency with acute bleeding episode. And when we opened the abdomen, this was what we found. The entire placenta extending actually up to the lateral pelvic wall. So after this, we decided it is extremely important to empower ourselves to be able to understand what are the basic techniques that can help us in reducing the mortality and morbidity in the mother. So uh, basically, like I said, I'm going to focus on two basic techniques. One is the retro uh, basical lower uterine segment bypass. This was uh, actually published by Pelosi Sr. and his son, Pelosi Jr. in the year 1999. Now, uh, in those days, basically, uh, it was for hysterectomy following a previous card uterus. Today, it also has an application in uh, uh, the placenta accreta spectrum. 
then this was the second type that this is the second type that is selman technique of cesarean hysterectomy through the pouch of douglas so uh, what is exactly the retrovesical lower uterine segment bypass whatever be the technique now what is done is actually the uh, this is the uh, bladder and this is the uterus this is the superior surface of the bladder okay and this is the fundus and then you have the base so what you find here is that there is the loose areolar tissue between the vagina the cervix and the bladder and then this is the lower uterine segment so majority of the cases if there is a scar or the placenta the infection is here so we wish to do this we wish to find the space here and then do the dissection from below upwards so whether it be the pelosis technique or the selman technique the aim is to reach this space so in the retrovesical approach what is done is basically after delivering the baby the round segment is uh, you know it is incised and the anterior leaf of the broad segment is opened about 2 cm lateral to the uterus at the level of uterine artery so when you do it at the level of uterine artery it becomes easy to also dissect out the uterine artery which can be easily ligated that is a part of devascularization of the uterus so after distending the bladder by uh, with, uh, with it could be even normal saline or the, the authors they themselves do use the 300 cc of methane blue then dissection is carried from the lateral to the medial aspect you identify the lateral uh, limits of the bladder go further down and then go from below upwards and before you start dissecting any further ligate the uterine vessels and then break down the scar or the placental tissue and finally uh, and uh, the important point that i wish to stress here is stay between the superficial endopelvic fascia of the bladder and the lower cervix so um, after doing that so uh, it is all initially by blunt dissection then go upwards dissect out the vesico uterine fold break down the a uh, placental uh, invasion into the bladder sometimes you might be required to do a cystotomy remove that part of the bladder which has been invaded into by the placenta and finally deliver the uterus along with the uh, cord so uh, the along with the placenta so having devascularized the uterus the area of the placental invasion of the bladder uh, of the placenta into the bladder the point i wish to uh, basically emphasize here is that a sharp dissection is a good idea once you have devascularized the uterus to avoid laceration and oozing from the tissues so uh, it is as simple as that and uh, the advantage is a re relatively avascular paravesical space is very easy to develop this is something many of us would have actually done even otherwise you know here there is a way of describing things so whenever we undertake a vaginal hysterectomy or a non descent vaginal hysterectomy we know if you were to uh, we know the additions are basically in the central part so when you dissect out the bladder when you go from the lateral to the medial aspect then the chances of injuring the bladder are much lesser you start from below upwards a vascular plane is there in the in the space between the bladder and the upper vagina and the cervix basically that part just above the trigon of the bladder and the devascularization of the uterine arteries is also easily accomplished this is the second type that is the selman's technique through the pouch of douglas now here what uh, is done is the, the now this is the placenta which is invading into the bladder now uh, what is done is the approach is through the uh, the posterior uh, the pouch of the glass as the name itself suggests so after delivering the baby and after closing the hysterectomy what one does is you lift up the uterus and make it extremely anterior and then introduce a spawn folder through the pouch of the glass open the pouch of douglas and go into the vagina that means you give an incision into the vagina posteriorly so having done that then you extend it laterally then go uh, go on applying a serial uh, uh, clamps uh, you know in the upper and the lower lip of the vagina go further laterally catch the uh, uterine arteries and also uh, remove the uh, suspensions of the cervix that is the cardinal ligaments and after that once you go anteriorly so you incise the vaginal wall from posterior to lateral and then dissection of the tissue between the bladder and the anterior vaginal wall cut off the anterior vaginal wall mobilize the bladder from the uterus again from below upwards repair the urinary tract if required and closure of the vaginal cup 
so it is as simple as that and uh, believe me it is actually very simple and this was a technique that we, we had to use in that photograph that i showed you and uh, successfully we could uh, do much of the dissection unfortunately since the entire ureter on the left side had got engulfed into the placenta we had to transect that ureter and also undertake a cystotomy and remove a part of the bladder but uh, where you know in the fresh cases it is a very useful technique to know so the following slide basically shows the um, the technique the video so what is done is uh, first the hysterectomy is done they have given a transverse incision at the fundus after delivering the baby the hysterectomy is closed and then the round ligament is ligated so uh, after that the retroperitoneum so what is uh, i'm sorry about that so basically after uh, catching the round ligament the retroperitoneum is exposed this is a, a video given out by the authors themselves so they followed it up with internal iliac ligation uh, what we find with experience is probably that is not really required at the present point of time the uh, we have done most of our cases without undertaking internal iliac ligation because it could be again a technically difficult procedure but if if one is able to undertake that easily it is certainly a good idea to do so otherwise simply go ahead and catch the uterine vessels so after uh, you know catching the round ligament opening the retroperitoneum the utero ovarian ligaments and the tubes are ligated divided and ligated the coronal structures so after that it is simply the opening of the posterior vaginal fornix the posterior vagina to the fornix so serial clamps are applied the the vagina is circumscribed from posterior to anterior and the cervix is pulled posteriorly traction is applied through the vagina onto the cervix posteriorly so this is how so what they have done is after having removed the attachments of the cervix you introduce a finger below the cervix and go from below upwards and separate the bladder from the uterus and the uterovesical fold of peritoneum is incised and the last attachment of the bladder from the uterus is removed and then the hysterectomy is completed so it is simply that so the limitations of this procedure exposure of the cul-de-sac and the uterine arteries might be a little difficult uh, especially so for the internal iliac uh, artery uh, uh, the ligation of the internal iliac arteries because the uterus is enlarged and the cervical traction which is uh, pulled posteriorly might result in transmission of that uh, traction into the anterior aspect of the lower segment and there is a chance of avulsion of the placental vessels thereby increasing the chances of hemorrhage so one can actually pre apply pressure anteriorly when you are actually applying uh, you know traction on the cervix of course there are also chances of ureteric injuries which can happen even otherwise a few uh, important points when one is uh, undertaking hysterectomy uh, by whatever method in a pregnant uterus i just wish to refresh our memories Uh, there are two important points to be remembered that there are enlarged and distended vessels because of pregnancy and the uh, uh, pelvic tissues are very friable so it's always a good idea to consider double clamping of the uh, pedicles so uh, what one does is you apply see this this is the orange arrow the first pedicle has been clamped and cut and before you transfix that you apply the second clamp just beyond the tip of the first clamp so this prevents the tearing of the tissues and also the laceration of these tissues thereby avoiding unnecessary blood loss and also retraction of these tissues and then it is important to remember to secure the uterine vessels prior to uh, bladder dissection and it's not a good idea to use blunt dissection if you were to use a sponge stick 
to get the bladder down over these kind of vessels one can imagine the kind of torrential hemorrhage one could be faced with so i would like to conclude to say that it is important to remember to not unnecessarily manipulate the uterus elective surgery is always better you uh, arrange adequate amount of blood take the requisite kind of consent have seniors available the anesthetist the surgeons experienced surgeons are extremely important for this kind of complex surgery and in case it was an unexpected finding on the table and if the patient is not bleeding heavily and resources for management are not immediately available it's a good idea to cover the uterus with warm packs delay the surgery further the abdomen can be closed and transfer the patient to a higher center expeditiously complex hysterectomies should only be undertaken in tertiary centers multidisciplinary team and with experienced surgeons i wish to emphasize this again so with that i thank you so much for your patient listening thank you dr uh, radhika uh, is, uh, are you ready dr amita uh, dr radhika uh, yes. i have got one or two comments yes ma'am uh, the two methods that you described are very useful in cases of 3b where there is involvement of bladder extensively but i think in 3c where the placenta has extended into the broad ligament that's always um, I, a challenge yes in, in the, the even applying these two methods are not going to help much much no, in that uh, basically uh, what is um, the problem the, the uh, to a certain extent the selman technique is helpful so you go below the broad ligament actually and then uh, go anteriorly because you are approaching through the vagina uh, if it is in the broad ligament the first technique by pilosi is certainly a big no whereas if it is the vessels are confined to the medial aspect of the broad ligament and if we were to open the vagina from below first and slowly start Uh, you know circ- circumscribing around the vagina go laterally and go on ligating the vessels one by one it happens but then that is not the final answer that is not the best answer we still are looking for an answer when there is extensive broad ligament uh, uh, extension of the placenta it's a huge challenge so sometimes you have to do an end block application of the clamps and sometimes you have to go extremely laterally or sometimes you even need to ligate the internal iliac vessel first catch the uterine right from the origin so all sorts of uh, combinations are there there is no final answer for that kind of a problem yes ma'am i agree with you so if dr amita is ready dr alka alka dr alka alka yeah so for the first presentation can we start Yeah, okay, ma'am. Please share your screen. There any uh, Amit? Is there uh, any problem with internet connection of Doctor Alka? Uh, no, actually, that time, ma'am, uh, madam was not able to unmute herself. Yes, she has come. Yeah. She has come, but she is uh, like slide share and this thing. So. If there is any issue, we can start with the panel. Uh, just tell me the, because we are already late, yeah. na? so better not. To uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Then then we'll start panel discussion. Then uh, we'll take. So with the permission of the chairpersons only, Doctor Fardosi and Doctor Nita Singh, should we start uh, the panel discussion? Yeah, I think so. Yes, sir. Yes. You can go ahead. Yes. You can go ahead. so uh, we welcome uh, all the panelists for this very very important session of the clinical this, uh, this placenta atrophy syndrome and uh, i am going straight away so uh, we welcome uh, our panelists uh, dr t ramni devi uh, yes uh, so it is about me uh, you can like yes please Dr. T. Damni, who is managing director, Ram Krishna Medical Center LLP, has been chairperson endometriosis committee, has been recipient of many many awards, and at present she is vice president Foxy two zero two zero and a very ardent worker. So that Madam, our... please let me introduce you. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> okay. 
ओके आफ्टर द फर्स्ट सेशन वी मूव ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट सेकंड सेशन व्हिच इज पैनल डिस्कशन एंड दिस पैनल डिस्कशन इज ऑन प्लेसेंटा एक्रेटा स्पेक्ट्रम चैलेंजेस टू मॉडरेट दिस सेशन वी हैव स्टालवर्ट ऑफ फॉक्सी एंड रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ऑफ फॉक्सी टू सेफॉक डॉ साधना गुप्ता मैडम विद अस डॉ साधना गुप्ता मैडम हैज हैड मेजर अचीवमेंट like foxy she is foxy representative to safog 2018 21 she is icog governing council member to k15 to 2020 she is corresponding editor of journal of obgy india 17 20 she has been vice president foxy in 2016 currently she is president gorakhpur chapter of icop pap 2020 her present she is director and senior consultant consultant gynecologist at jeevan jyoti hospital and medical research center gorakhpur madam has different uh, special interest in high risk pregnancy operative and critical care in obstetric safe motherhood initiative and many more madam had publications research 20 original research publications madam i welcome you and hand i over to you for the panel discussion please introduce Thank your you panelist for the very good nice introduction and uh, okay. we will be continuing with the panel and uh, we have introduced dr ramni our own and the next panelist is uh, uh, next i can have the next slide please dr melinsha who is resident isoprap 1618 has been vice president foxy Uh, the fellow of icog iog managing committee members of many professional organization and he, he has authored many books and the good papers at present she is professor he is professor and head department of ob gyni gandhi nata h medical college our next esteemed panelist is uh, our next panelist is dr arup maji who is professor and head department of geo rajikar medical college kolkata he is national vice president isofar president kolkata chapter isopar and has been president bengal rocks and gyni society and he has authored many book the is a very very good teacher so it's good to have dr arup maji who is working in the tertiary care and in the medical college the next panelist is dr meena saman who is the organizer of this event and the chairperson of clinical research committee secretary general Indian Society of Perinatology Vice President Patna Obi Gyni Society and she is consultant and HOD Purli Holy Family Hospital and she, she has a special interest in high risk pregnancy uh, we are missing dr hita tulbar uh, from nepal because of the certain emergency because her brother in law is suddenly sick so uh, i will request dr radhika to be in the panel so we are starting um, the panel Uh, placenta accreta syndrome and uh, our actually aim is that we have to save mother dr sadhana just one minute yes can, can we um, uh, set the rules that how the audience can participate so i either they will go in the chat box or question answer so uh to me uh, madam if i am uh, correct and amit uh, dr amita sinha will coordinate the question answer session and uh, the audience is participating in their chat box and dr amita sinha and amit will be coordinating the question answer session after the panel uh, am i right amit yes, yes ma'am after all yes, the lectures madam after all the lectures we will after take after all the lectures at the yes, end of the session we will take question answer session okay Uh, so uh, our actually aim of this uh, session is that we have to save mothers everywhere irrespective of the woman lives where so i bring greetings from foxy and sapor uh, so it is been defined everybody knows that it is abnormal trophoblast invasion of either part or all of the placenta into myometrium of uterine wall the term it describes aberrant placentation which is characterized by abnormally implanted either implanted invasive or adher placenta and it is the latin word actually word which is act plus result which is to adhere or become attached to so attachment is evil the spiritual people says and who knows better than obstetrician where we face the placenta accreta with severe maternal morbidity and mortality 
because of severe and sometimes life threatening hemorrhage and related complications so here we are from 1 to 400 very rare and uncommon consequence to now it is 1 to by 4 Hundred, which was very rare in nineteen eighty two when we were resident. So it is acrita, which is most common, seventy eight percent, and acrita seventy percent, and perfita five percent. A uh, one thing which I wish to share with the panelists as well as the audience that actually we don't know that which patient will develop the placenta acrita. Yes, it is the combination of cesarean scar deficiency of decidua bacillus, but there has been the constitutional endometrial defect. and there has been noted the hyper invasiveness and the angiogenesis for the cytotrophoblast so some women are prone to develop the placenta acrita syndrome and some are not so with this foxy and cephog this slide actually pricks our consciousness because we see this almond color in the area of maternal mortality that is around 100 to 300 and as is south asia and africa contributes to 99% of maternal death in low middle income countries and all the old thing we are having nutrition anemia obstructed labor and now we are facing also the morbid adherent placenta and our aim of this symposium if this webinar is that let our system work together because we have to have the good functioning system to save our lives so coming to the panel uh, anybody can take the question it is a busy obstetrical opd always and in that busy opd how you rule out that this patient can be prone to placenta acrita syndrome so we want to give you the clear messages to the audience that when you are seeing the patient how to pick up the high risk phase for the proper detailed evaluation for the ps that this patient need further evaluation so any panelist can take the question uh very good yeah can i take this question sadna yes sure yeah okay now see this is a very good panel i must say big thanks to you as well as meena for this wonderful discussion happy to see all my friends uh you know friends actually it's very true that uh, the question is very very important because all those cases of previous cesarean all those cases who have undergone repeated curettage and where the placenta is anterior i think we should always and always teach our residents that she could be a probable case of pas and accordingly we need to investigate her similarly all those cases where previous history of infection could be the after months which got actually uh, treated and now she is conceived Uh, all those cases we need to presume that there is every probability of placental adhesion and accordingly our evaluation should start anyone so thank else? you very much maybe sir the important thing you have told that it is every previous cesarean and the risk of infection which is so many times we tend to miss any panelist will like to yeah. add to milin summit uh, yeah dr uh, sadna yes Uh, Dr. Sadha, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, in fact, we will have pick up also not only the PBS cesarean section and placenta PBA. We will have to pick up the cases where more to develop the placenta acrita syndrome. An important factor is the PBA history of the abortion and the recurrent curettage. That is one important point. Another thing, the any uterine surgery PBA like myomectomy, that is very also important. Or other things that the EP there is any history of Asherman syndrome or like that, and more multipara multipara patients are more developed to uh, prone to develop the placenta acrita syndrome, the multipara multipara mother. And advanced maternal advanced maternal age is another. This is these are the factors. And recently, for uh, to detect the high risk cases, there are some important biomarkers. Biomarkers have been developed, though the predictive value is small, but it has been found. those who are prone to develop the placenta acrita syndrome they have some important biomarker that is uh, the adrenaline silva alpha protein the uh, free beta hcg and also placental uh, lactogen and yes. the, uh, yeah, these are the, the several biomarkers 
Although no such predictive factor. I would but, uh, like to add to the uh, high risk is another thing that is coming more and more these days is uh, the history of IVF pregnancies. Yeah, I think yeah. I would like to add to my list. So yeah. thank okay. you very much. I think we all the panelists have covered almost. And Dr. Roop, thank you for this bringing up that thing that grand multiparity and the extreme of age is still. It is not only the placenta previa and the cesarean section. It is the grand multiparity also, which is very relevant in our country. So it is. Madam, I would like to. The, yes. Madam, I would like to add up some more points. As rightly yes. Pamina pointed out, all ART pregnancies we have to rule out, especially in case of endometriosis, because there is always a high risk of placenta previa. Then other one is any intrauterine hysteroscopic procedures, namely hysteroscopic resection of submucous myoma or thermal ablation. And in some of the textbooks, they have even mentioned about the arterial embolization. And uh, Asherman's, I think somebody has uh, has pointed out. So these are the things uh, what I would like to add up. Thank you, Ramni, very much. Because, you know, in, in, in all South Asia, what we are struggling, we have all grand multiplicity, multiple curators. Yes. And we have also all the very advanced obstetrics, that is IVF pregnancy, endometriosis, hysteroscopy, endometrial ablation, nothing. So we have to be very, very cautious. And this slide shows that if we have more than two cesarean, the risk of placenta theta 11% to five cesarean, that is 67%. And all of the panelists have already taken, it is cesarean section, endometrial ablation, myomectomy, spatially hysteroscopy, which is very, very common. I really fear for so many hysteroscopy workshops that what is happening to their endometrial. <laughs> Really, to be very frank, and I and the one thing clinical that any patient having having a vagina vagina trimester, they should be followed for the central atria as well. And ultrasound, it is again important that if we are rating the routine ultrasound, if there is a detail like what is the placental appearance, we should be uh, very very particular. So it is all we are saying. So now coming to the next question, which Dr. Rupmadi has already said, we have picked up that these patients are prone to develop placenta equita. And how you want to confirm the patient, what is your modality, your choice of modality? You do ultrasound, if ultrasound, then when, in which trimester? And how you want to do the ultrasound, it is a little, and when, and when, you select question in the last that when you want to add the MRI. So we can start again from, I think, Milin, we will take the same uh, sequence, so we involve all the panelists, yes. Good. Uh, yes, very true. Uh, quite often, um, I see these actually reports coming to me, coming in the first trimester, saying about the chorionic frondosum, or sometimes early second trimester, they mention about placenta previa or the adherent placenta, which is not actually true. We'll have to wait till the mid-pregnancy, and after that, we should start suspecting. The science is evolving in a very large way. I used to remember, we always used to teach our students, we used to tell on various platforms, that sonolescent area, which is there behind placenta, each diagnostic of, or rather diagnostic for the ruling out the adherent placenta. But eventually we learn that that is not the story. Even in those cases also we can find adhesions. And that's how we need to take the help of Doppler uh, and the color for putting them properly to see whether they are adhesions of the placenta. And in the cases where still it is inclusive, the MRI can definitely play a great role in uh, finding out that adhesion and accordingly we can decide. So, Dr. Arup, as a teacher and uh, the uh, working in uh, you, will Dr. Milin to has covered some finding you should do. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Milin has uh, covered many things, but uh, placenta acrita syndrome can be diagnosed from the early pregnancy, not so in the first trimester, but always in high risk cases. You must have to the screen of the all patients for patient actitus in various cases at the time of the 18 to 20 <coughs> that the anomaly scan is done. Right. And if you suspect that is the placenta acrita, uh, so you will have to do it repeat. But what should be the repeat, uh, periodical repeat, 
it is not uh, really uh, at present it is not settled but it is done usually at 28 to 30 weeks another is the 32 to 34 weeks because we must have to know the exact location of the placenta what is the invasion of the depth of the invasion of the placenta and what is the degree 3 a b c like like that that is the uh, there is about the ultrasound and the findings of the ultrasound you are asking me findings in the ultrasound and it is the uh, spaces it is the placental uh, in the myometrium and placenta there is a multiple lacunar space the most important part in in the gray scale and also there is the loss of interface between the placenta and the myometrium and the thickness between, uh, of the myometrium because less very 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 less and there may be the bulging of the bulging of the uh, placenta and in fact if the ultrasound is done very well by the expert ultrasonologist it should be done by the ultrasonologist there is uh, mri has uh, no such value mri has a special value where where the placenta is located in behind that is the posterior placenta and where there is the lateral extension even uh, dr radhika has said some cases there will the how much it is lateral extended up to the invasion of the parametrium but routinely the if the ultrasound is done by uh, expert ultrasonologist eh, it is at, uh, in the first investigation enough and in the color of blood there will be the turbulent the typical finding of the turbulent placental flow can be can be seen so this is the summary regarding the usg and the and the mri Thank you very much, Ramni. You want to add something uh, to the yeah, thing which Milan and time. Dr. Arup has done? Yes. Yeah, we, uh, uh, Dr. Arup had made it very clearly. But one thing I wanted to add is, in some of the special special situations, we need to go ahead with the transvaginal ultrasound. Also, yes. it will help Can you to done. where is the extension. Whether from anterior it is extending up to the posterior wall, and then the uh, uh, thickness we can make it out very clearly. And plus, you have, can measure the length of the cervix, which will help us to give an idea whether the patient is likely to go for a preterm labor or not. So I always prefer doing a combination of trans abdominal and a trans vaginal ultrasonogram in suspected cases of uh, 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 this uh, placenta previa, provided they don't bleed much. Because bleeding. Thank you very much, even uh, Ramni. Even if the bleeding placenta previa is not a contraindication to vaginal. Sir, for transvaginal. We have to know that we put the probe in the anterior fornix. Uh, Dr. Radhika raised her hand and she wants to add something. So, Radhika, please. Yeah, I just wanted to also highlight the importance of the bladder plane. You know, uh, when we are talking about 3B and 3C, so uh, invasion into the bladder. So, characteristically, if everything is well. So if you have the blood initially full, then one is able to very clearly make out the space. The the it's a it's a white line between the bladder and the uterus. The, uh, the 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 plane between the two is very nicely seen. If there is disruption, which could be in the form of some scarring, or there could be parallel lines, there could be Doppler flow, which is there in the interface between them. It's it it is a great pointer to say that uh, there is an invasion. It's percreta which has gone. Beyond the surface of the uterus, so I think Doppler is important, and also to look for the continuity of the interface between the two viscera. Thank you, much. thank you very much. I think every panelist has given their but uh, yes, Doctor Parvati, please. Yes, I, I want to make a comment because here is the point that uh, what about first trimester? That because now, right. yeah, because um, for the first trimester we know that um, now it is cesarean skin pregnancy is not that enough. And ultrasonogram is the mainstay. And there are studies, I think, um, uh, and in one study, they, they followed up 40 cases of uh, cesarean scar pregnancy. Uh -huh. And uh, because they managed this conservatively, they wanted to manage it after counseling, they wanted the pregnancy to be stained. So about 30% ended in abortion. And about 30% ended in mid trimester abortion or termination. And fortunately, about 20% of the, almost 20 to 30% could reach the age of viability. So it's it's a danger, of course. But the thing is, uh, it can be diagnosed in the first trimester. And most of us, we go for uh, treatment. But if the patient wants to continue, 
So th this is the statistic. So you always sit on the fire if, if we deal with a case of placenta previa. In fact, ma'am, in the first trimester, any yeah. pregnancy which is located in the lower uterine segment, which, which is low down, which is towards the scar, uh, there is a high chance of it becoming later as a morbidly adherent placenta. It, it's an abnormal implantation site, actually. So oh, one could thank actually you very much. Actually, uh, this slide shows the same thing which Dr. Fardosi and Dr. Radhika says that if you see scar pregnancy, if the sac is lower down, this is very, very important predictor of placenta accreta syndrome. And as Dr. Fardosi has said very, very correctly that if the cesarean scar pregnancy wish to continue, and sometimes the clinician are not sure that it will be what way it will go, they result into the placenta accreta syndrome. Uh, one important thing which we want to add to all the audience that the first trimester measurement of smallest myometrial thickness, that can also predict, so make a habit what you're seeing in this slide, the small, that is the reduced myometrial thickness beyond the sac, that is also very important. So we have to take a, a issue is that we take the good pictures, we read them carefully, and if we are doing, many of citizens are doing their own ultrasound, we should be star pregnancy minded because so many times it comes into the missed abortion and when we like do any MTP or empty people, suddenly patient is bleeding. So the location of the star pregnancy and keeping this thing in mind that it is not moving with the probe, uh, it may be star pregnancy is very, very important. So first trimester, smallest myometrial thickness, these uh, um, like things has been discussed by uh, or very well explained by the Dr. Roop and Dr. Millen that placenta previa with section is of course a very very important indicator. Multiple vascular lacunae. There is like we say when with the placenta and the myometrium, you don't see a big buffer zone. You be very very alert and. As Dr. Radhika said, we have to be careful about the bladder invasion that there is no irregularity into the boundary. Again, I say we know it uh, like in mind, but when we take the picture, we should be very careful pointing out to that. So many ultrasonologists don't think in the way of the placenta accreta and the placenta previa and miss the finding. So very careful ultrasound and very careful interpretation is very, very urgent need of our area. Color Doppler, I think all the panelists have said, I will take only one thing that the, what is very easy, you do the color Doppler on, you see there are so many vessels pulsating into the placenta. Make sure that you take the advice of expert, take the second opinion to confirm or exclude placenta accreta. So multiple lacunae and turbulent flow, this is most strongly predictor of the placenta accreta. And it is very easy. The important thing is that we should be very, very careful. Now coming to next practical question. That, yes, we know the ultrasound. We know the things. We have taken the good picture. Are you becoming... In your practice, you really, like doctor, we are missing some ultra, besides having a good ultrasound, we sometimes receive the false positive or false negative report, or we you see the different opinion by the two or three ultrasonologists. And the third thing is, does ultrasound really help you in reliably predicting depth of placental invasion? So anybody can take question. We can start with Arup and the Milena. I'm not seeing Arup, Radhika, and anybody can take. That the inter-observer and not intra-observer, what is actually, are we very blame ourselves if we miss the diagnosis of placenta accreta? That's the thing. Yes. Uh, there is an important blinded study uh, inter for inter-observable inter variation, the six sonologists. It has been found there is a difference of opinion. So it is very difficult uh, to come to the conclusion always. Those who are which are easy, they are very easy. But always it is not possible. So specialist sonologists will have to uh, see it. And if there is any problem, more problem, we'll have to take the help of the MRI. That is the role of the M MRI at that uh, at that situation. And Dr. Radhi, uh, Dr. Sadhana, I am on to stress one thing regarding the scar ectopic pregnancy and, and the placenta accreta syndrome. This is actually the same disorder and the spectrum of the same disorder. 
so it is i want to emphasize is that when a patient is detected the scar ectopic we must have to counsel the patient and the patient party regarding the future prospect whether it because early pregnancy whether you will to terminate or not that is very important point and we will have to uh, and the next so this is one actually what we say that we have to set our system so ultrasonologist is a very good modality but what experience all around the world we have to accept that we have a different level of expertise in every region so it is 54% specificity and 88% positive we are good enough to detect placenta accreta in anterior placenta but many time we miss the posterior placenta accreta or fundal placenta accreta so this is very very important that identification of morbid adderall placenta with sonography should always be interpreted along with clinical and when then again the operative findings so that we can review it so yeah. we have to set our limitation and it is the scog latest recommendation that is the oh, western right. world but they say that ultrasound evaluation is important but absence of ultrasound finding does not preclude our diagnosis of ps and this is particularly true in reasons where ultrasonography expertise in identifying features of ps may be limited so we have to be very very thorough our clinical pickups and we should always keep in the mind even if they say that it may be plus minus placenta accreta we should by we are operating we should be very very careful so i think one question about you want to repeat arup has taken a little bit of uh, this question uh, that when you want to you have seen uh, i will take to ramani this thing that 20 week placenta previa previous cesarean low lying placenta when you want to repeat the ultrasounds uh, at what interval and when it is really crucial to have the repeated ultrasound yes ramne uh, when she is asymptomatic i think the routine follow up we can do it after repeat it after 8 weeks at 28 weeks then again at 32 weeks in between if the patient is having uh, if she becomes symptomatic i think more frequently we need to do it so when we have a doubt about the uh, uh, invasion this pas then maybe in such situations we can utilize the mri that may so help we will it. come to mri actually everybody is saying mri we will say what the world says about mri so <laughs> rightly it is 18 to 20 28 to 30 and 30 to 34 it is reasonable it is not very strict sort of thing what we want to see that the placenta is going upwards it is becoming upper segment to our relief then yes. placenta location went to deliver and the possible bladder invasion which as we have seen a beautiful presentation by radhika just bladder invasion actually sets you the stage of different planning for the surgery so we have to be very very particular and uh, ma'am excuse me yes radhika yes sir i just received a message from the audience they are not able to see, read the slide well so they are uh, requesting you to put it on the slide mode Slide, 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 sl
obstetrician should make the diagnosis or the radiologist so this is very important and how far we are very able to read as well as do ultrasound majority of us many of us but in reading mri scan our abilities expertise is not so so dr fardosi has already raised and answered this question uh, i will say that dr arup i think in all the panelists say that whenever you are confused you go for mri but what evidence and experience says that only there are select situation when mri can help it is not it will help when sonography is inconclusive and when there is a posterior placenta previa and you want to and when you have to want a real like a depth what is depth it is in broad ligament or this thing so these are the few things you try and bulging heterogeneous signal uh, intensity yeah, and yeah actually see yes, yes, sir i wanted to add one point here yes, about yes, mri yes, yes. See, what happens whenever we speak about mri we always think it as a replacement to the ultrasound but suppose we take the role of mri as a complement to the ultrasound so as i said the posterior placenta where we are really unable to you know sometimes find it very difficult or even the cesarean scar pregnancies quite often ultrasound has certain limitations so suppose we take the role of mri as a complementary role probably yes in some of these cases definitely it is useful but one need to understand that it is not the replacement it is a complementary role with the ultrasound findings whereby yes. we can clinch the diagnosis properly and accordingly the management can be done and one more clinical point about this ultrasound actually again i wanted to convey to my audience what i have noticed over here especially in the low lying placenta suppose she has a you know low lying placenta since second trimester and she never had a single episode of even spotting always and always suspect there must be some morbid adhesions because those are the cases where there there may not be pv bleeding but the placenta is low lying all the time since you see her and you always suspect some sort of uh, adhesion in that placenta yeah so thank you very much so it is a complimentary it is not a higher we have to read and we have to sometimes actually even sometimes to become we are safe that if we go to a something life threatening complication why mri was not done that is also issue in india but this is very important that the accuracy of mri is also ranging from 75 to 100 percent and one important question with all the cochrane review is that these studies of mri are even more prone to selection bias because these are done on the patient who have got the indeterminate ultrasound or very high risk of pregnancy not all patient of the adherent placenta or the placenta previa goes to mri so mri has got its special place but it has very limited and sometimes can be the complementary what acog says it is unclear whether mri improves the diagnosis of ps beyond that achieved with ultrasound alone accordingly mri is not the preferred modality for the initial evaluation of the possible ps so for initial evaluation most of the thing is the 2d ultrasound gray ultrasound followed by color doppler and mri whenever is the indicated so and dr arup has asked said something about the biomarkers so i will like ask the question to dr arup as well that uh, in your routine clinical practice you are using biomarkers for the placenta accreta evaluation so dr arup can you take this question what biomarker and you have found is useful or not yes uh, it is a very good question dr sunda but still the biomarker is should not be the routine because it has no such predictive value and these there may be the false positive and false negative the important biomarker are when they are suspecting the uh, placenta accreta syndrome the important biomarkers are the uh, alpha fetoprotein maternal ancilla alpha fetoprotein and the free beta hcg i have already said placental uh, lactogen and also the uh, cell free met, uh, rna m rna so these are the actually the biomarker but that is uh, not done routinely i do not know whether in india the biomarkers are done for uh, investigated to uh, know the placenta diagnose the placenta accreta syndrome so 
modalities So thank you very much. And Dr. Radhika, are you using you in UCMS any biomarker for these difficult cases? No, you not at all, ma'am. Actually, none of them are specific. The, there is, you know, predictability of any of these is like Dr. Madhya had said earlier. Uh, it's very poor the predictability, predictive outcome of uh, any of these markers. And ultrasound is a fairly good modality to uh, identify the problem. So I really don't think, uh, you know. for the present we have that kind of thank you very much for this clear that the biomarker doesn't add an mri also doesn't add much to it so we have diagnosed and confirmed the placenta accreta and she is around 24 week pregnant so i will like start from i think from milin that what you are now you want to do it is she is 24 you are saying that it is looking placenta accreta 99% so how you are going to have the antenatal care and how you are going to plan all that the situation what is happening so milin please yeah basically uh, whenever we suspect any sort of adhesion or uh, the placental problems it's always and always very much essential part to uh, do the proper counseling with the patient as well as the family because she may land up with any catastrophe in between before term as well so we need to arrange for her proper actually uh, uh, staying as well as the uh, she should reach to the center or to the hospital well in time suppose she bleeds because this bleeding could be torrential at times and sometimes it could be in the emergency for that center as well if they are not well prepared with that particular uh, catastrophe so first and foremost thing is you must sit with your patient as well as relatives and tell them what actually we are heading for what i do in my patients of all those placenta previa as well as the placental adhesions always tell them that this is something like you know dealing with the time bomb sometimes it can give us a lot of problem in our practice but we suppose we are prepared we are very much you know successful as well in treating those particular cases once they understand it all those lame excuses that she had gone outside that particular city she was unable to reach she comes with the shock won't arrive and after that one need to mark those cases properly with the red pen on the antenatal card that these are the cases where we are where we are suspecting this particular condition and then accordingly immediately certain code need to be regenerated like our staff our sisters our attendants they should understand whenever she reaches hospital with even a small bout of bleeding we should immediately arrange for all those necessary thing like keeping the blood ready and the keeping the staff and the anesthesiologist and pediatrician ready as well so suppose we do that those drills uh, well in advance i'm very sure quite few of them were the successful stories as well thank one you more thing actually the one last thing actually which i wanted to tell them about is the sometimes we may land up with obstetric hysterectomy and that again need to be at least spell in front of patient that this is the possibility we may not be able to you know uh, keep the uterus and we need to remove it so we do that suppose in a well in advance all those medical legal issues which come up afterwards may not arise and all those things need to be documented yes so, dr okay, sabna just want to add dr sabna just want to add one yes yes during yes. antenatal period at the patient will be advised to come frequently and check up frequently and the counseling the important thing is that there is a possibility of severe hemorrhage torrential hemorrhage during the surgery so we will have to see the hemoglobin level and the patient will have to treat if there is any anemia we will have to treat in in some cases we will have to not only the oral 
iron tablet also it may we will have to give the iron injection also so hemoglobin estimation and the normalization of the hemoglobin before going for termination is very important in these cases yeah. that oh, is very important thank you very much arup and milin our uh, dr arup has said very very beautifully that iron deficiency anemia can be matter of life and death in our setup because patient can bleed any time whether we give oral we give iv whatever we give but maintain the iron thing uh, iron deficiency anemia should be corrected and secondly the counseling 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 We, I remember seven or eight years ago when we used to do these uh, uh, sessions, and people say we say obstetrical hysterectomy patient will run away. Now with this, now I think many many obstetrician are convinced that we have to uh, tell them the possibility of obstetrical hysterectomy because till now it is the safest procedure for the obstetrical hysterectomy. Now I will ask one question to Ramani that what is your what you suggest to audience what is the good time to deliver this patient usually all say that 38 39 week does morbid adherent placenta comes in that category we will say to ramani and then uh, meena yes there, there is no fixed or timing that we must deliver this patients it depends upon the symptoms if the patient is uh, symptomatic if it is bleeding heavily i think we did not bother about the gestational age we have to think into the safety of the mother and then go ahead with delivery then in case if the patient is having only minimal amount of bleeding and we have already diagnosed it as a case of uh, pas then i think it is better to wait go beyond 34 weeks giving a dose of antenatal steroid and ideal thing as our uh, others have mentioned it has to be planned in a place where you have all facilities to manage like a multidisciplinary team should be there otherwise if the patient is okay doing well without uh, not heavy bleeding we can go up to 36 or 37 weeks of gestation but i feel going beyond 37 weeks is not safe it's better you do it do it deliver it between 34 and 36 weeks depending so, upon this so it is 36 week dr radhika when you plan such cases what you mentioned in your lecture when you call the patient for the surgery at what gestational age because so many times we are having hysterectomy and the baby is also premature and she is maybe the terminal uh, loss of fertility so what's your protocol in your institution please no we do uh, similarly i completely agree with dr ramani so uh, the point is the women who have had irregular spotting and you know continuously sometime you'd be other going on having some sort of a problem in the antenatal period they are the ones who have to be taken very seriously they are the ones who are very prone to have some kind of a mishap so probably on the, for such kind of women it is better to err on the side of caution and terminate the pregnancy at around 34 plus weeks whereas the ones who have been completely comfortable the ones who are asymptomatic and uh, everything has been fine one can probably comfortably wait till about 36 weeks so it is customized it, you know we cannot say that this is the way it should be so it is as per the patient's behavior and uh, we have to monitor things can change at any time so any time between 34 to 36 is a good idea so uh, one very very important message to audience is that don't go beyond 37 week it is 34 to 36 week even if the patient is not bleeding and if you are going beyond 35 week you should be ready the hospital administration should be ready that uh, if the patient comes with the bleeding we are ready to tackle with so we don't why we don't want to prolong beyond 36 37 week because patient might bleed and we may land up into the emergency which will really optimize sub optimize the obstetrical outcome we will have a one comment from dr fardosi begum for the timing of delivery what's the routine in your Uh, in bangladesh and what are the concern because the fertility is a big issue in our area so dr pardosi can you comment on it yeah thank you so much this is a vital question and this um, is uh, this is our problem as well when to terminate basically this depends on so many things the rule should be as you say we should not better not cross 37 weeks because that's the uh, we get, get a mature fetus but Uh, you never know. There may be some say the patient starts bleeding, and so so many things can happen. We know as obstetrician that what emergencies can brought. So better be as close to as 37 weeks as possible. That that uh, gives a 
uh, optimum outcome, I should say. So, so thank you. Uh, yes, yes, just yes, comment, yes, one comment. Yes. Yeah. There are the two guidelines 2018 and SUOG and RCOG. And RCOG wants to terminate to the 37 years, asymptomatic patient, asymptomatic. And I, SUOG clearly says they used to terminate within 36 weeks, not, not to extend beyond that. But there is a chance of bleeding and there is a more chance of emergency uh, surgery. So, better to do the 36 weeks. It should be the. So, 30, and 36 regarding the steroid, and the 36 is the safe for the baby and may be safe for the mother. So, this is the general consensus. Yeah. Uh, one thing is now, this is we are going to the like have the termination. If we have decided, we have built up the anemia, we have counseled. And one thing again, we have to in our area, we have to counsel the patient for the preparation for the blood transfusion for the ICU admission, for the NICU admission, because money arrangement is also very, very important yes. and we have to counsel them before and otherwise really we can't do many times we have to shift the patient or we can't do because the patient don't have money. Now she is the proven case. Yes. Regarding counseling, it is better we go for a video recording of the counseling, what we are doing. <laughs> That is that becomes very important nowadays because it's not the simple. <laughs> How much it will be visible? But Dr. I, Sandra, I, I want, want that he should not be that much legal minded and much patient minded. So uh, we Sandra. are coming to the same question, Rami. What to communicate okay. to the patient? Because you see, other if I say that do respect me, we go to the other. Why respect me? It is a one female child also. So what to communicate and how to plan? It is 35, 36 week you have called. What preparation in your OT, in your staff you want to make? What is the communication? So this is the vital question which our all audience wish to listen from the panelists. And we will start from the Ramni, but I think the video is too much <laughs> for many of the settings. Yes. yes, Ramni, you start from this. Yes. First thing is, you, uh, we have to, counseling part is okay. Like uh, we have to have a detailed counseling saying that it is ideal time for delivery. We have to tell ideal place of delivery and in the daytime and in a multidisciplinary hospital where you have facilities for a senior obstetrician. Very, that is very important. And a surgeon, preferably a gynec oncology surgeon who is well versed with uh, all those retroperitoneal dissections and a senior anesthesiologist. More than that, transfusion consultant, preferably a person who knows a good, adequately maintained blood bank is also necessary. Um, higher, then ventilatory support in case and an intensive coronary care unit and an intensive... We will, uh, Marani, in uh, the end, we will um, take the multidisciplinary, mm, how we can... Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, hemodynamic changes and... Um, uh, and a good NICU setup to look after the baby. These are the things I think minimal basic requirements what we need when we deliver a patient with uh, placenta previa. Actually, my question was I think, Milan, you can take it that yeah. woman uh, is yes. having first cesarean section and one female yeah. child. And so, it is uh, yeah. before yeah. you want to operate 15 days. So you are the most senior, but you are having a good nursing home, very senior. The, all deliveries are under you. And why you are referring me to somewhere as we don't know anything in government. So many COVID patients in government setup, I don't want to go there. So this is the thing that like it is first female child, what will happen? So these are very, very sensitive questions. And William, being a very senior practitioner, how you cope up with these pressures? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I told you, uh, rather part of this question I have covered in my previous answer of counseling. Very true. We have to convey this message that this is a basically dealing with a time bomb. It can give rise to many complications and suppose patient understand it. And to my actually, you know, the experience for last 35 years, I will tell you all those cases of pedar and placenta, we were able to give a very good success stories. Only one thing we failed about the money part, as you said very correctly, because that is important in spite of all those reports, quite few of the patients, they're unable to, you know, pay the hospital fees. And in spite of telling that, because it's a very, very uh, tender issue. And many of the cases, they don't pay fee at all. But 
otherwise preparation wise we need to keep the blood ready we need to arrange for the your friend obstetricians who can come for your rescue and all those documentation that's how whenever i actually uh, notice this as a comment from my uh, visiting obstetricians that how come your relatives are so quiet in spite of getting you know such a big problem of obstetric hysterectomy so much hemorrhage patient in shock and sometimes we needed to pay ship the patient to the icu setup as well but all that thing has supposed been told beforehand the compliance is good the patients they don't grumble much or they don't put you in the sew actually person in the medical legal era but money part is very big big question mark because in country like us quite often the patients are unable to pay but i always take that as a sort of you know service to the society that in those cases suppose you get little less money it is not a big deal we do so many other cases as well so we should take that in a positive note thank you milan very much for it because i say this is the very difficult decision for the patient to go for a strectomy at a small family size and sometimes not very we should be very transparent we should like express our limitation what this we can do and what we cannot do and if there is a very strong desire for fertility i think we can offer them that you go to the tertiary care where the interventional radiologists are available but even they cannot assure that it will happen so many times i refer the patient and they get the hysterectomy done only so transparency is very very important so uh, yes yes what am i just uh, i mean i yes mean i mean please Ma'am, uh, I just do have some reservations about just mentioning if she's just had one girl child. I think in today's age and time, just having one girl child is a good option. I mean, I think uh, we should not, you know, be biased against the girls having a girl child. Is yes, good. yes, we know that we face the situation. Yes, why not? Sure, yes. Can I answer something? Yeah. Please, yeah. Number, uh, there are two things I need to uh, want to add. One is basically regarding counseling. Uh, as we uh, do the basic counseling of emergency preparedness, we had to. Uh, what, what Dr. Ramani correctly said we need to uh, record how we counsel. Basically, we should have a counseling form, particularly for this patient. What about the transport? What about the money? What about the distance from the hospital? What about the blood transfusion, blood, blood donors of herself? So these are so particular. We, we need to refer them to a proper place. That is all right. But the preparedness of the patient itself. And finally, she may land up with hysterectomy. This is a very big decision to make. And um, the, we, we should not tell her that you may die, but that we have give her Give the family the air that this is an extremely dangerous condition, and they must shift to the tertiary care centers as as close to the tertiary care centers as well. And we need not only to counsel our patient, but we need to teach our junior doctors that don't be too courageous because that you are maybe ending up with a very big problem. So it has to be very well equipped hospital with the, all the facilities necessary, uh, life saving facilities. Of High obstetric and neonatal facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because it is better to be very clear and a little bit hard also because the hardness is anyway it is about to come. So the patient and the family is also prepared for the everything. And when the outcome is good, they are happy. And if they are not not that good, what they desired, they are quite okay. So Dr. Fardosi has rightly said we should be very particular about the transcurrent patient is having adherent patient of 60 kilometer from the town. We have to say that keep your vehicle. ready in the night times you can come, you have to come any time you can it might be needed you must have money you must have three or four donors so these are the practical thing which we we really want to uh, like emphasize to the audience that don't be like feel shameful or hesitant in giving counseling we should be very very particular in planning and what professional body said that the ps should be delivered in a very good equipped center what dr ramni and everybody have emphasized now it is we have come to the table and a very very important question you have opened the patient uh, with the placenta previa or something 
uh, cesarean section, but it was plus minus placenta. Or if you have come emergency patient, you are operating for APH, and suddenly you find that it might be placenta accreta. So first, very important message: how you perceive that uh, before delivering the baby or before operating that this may be the placenta accreta. How to identify undiagnosed case, and if we identify or suspect, what to do next? We are having 60-70 percent of obstetrical healthcare system with the private two or three doctor. Even in district hospital, two or three doctor on the duty. So, what to do for the saving mothers? Radhika, you can take this question. How to diagnose the suspect? How to suspect the case of placenta accreta on the operation table? So, as soon as one opens the abdomen, if there are, uh, if you know, the first thing that strikes one is the increased vascularity. So uh, there is those strange kind of vessels, you know. Uh, they say characteristically there are parallel vertical vessels if they are present, especially over the lower uterine segment. Uh, it is indicative of probably a morbidity at an placenta, or uh, there could be increased vascularity in the broad segment. And uh, you know, other than that, it is also you know if one has some idea about the uh, ultrasound. And if the placental mapping has been done, and you know, if even in a emergency situation today, people generally bring their ultrasound reports, so that could further assist you in you know determining your suspicion on the table. In fact, that is what is the grading which has been given by FIGO in 2018. So one is the clinical appearance, and then followed by delivery of the baby. You try and give an incision above the level of the placenta. Wherever you see the maximum number of vessels, avoid that. Deliver, you know, just above that, either by a transverse or a vertical incision. And after that, you apply a slight. You know, even then, if you are not sure, you uh, apply a slight traction on the cord. If there is surface dimpling, then it goes very much to say that it is a morbidly aderent placenta. So uh, these are the. Very very important golden words, Radhika. That you are having a distorted, very distended lower uterine segment. Don't go to rush out the deliver baby by lower transverse incision. Blood vessels like a dis very very prominent vessels, and if there is, you see the placenta into surrounding tissue. So I'm sharing few pictures for the audience to be have a visible impression of these things. Please don't go straight away to. Perform a cesarean section in any case of APH or in any emergency situation. So, uh, Dr. Radhika has already told that in these situation, actually, uh, I will say again uh, uh, to any panelist, if there is a one person run hospital, I am to one or two obstetrician, and I find that it is placenta accreta. And I cannot like collect the system like the some senior obstetrician or ten unit of blood. What should I do to save these mothers? Should I perform hysterectomy or should I even after opening should we consider the transfer of the patient? So, yes. um, Doctor Arup or anybody yeah. can take yes. Uh, yes, that situation. If one comes, you do not have the resources, and rather than venturing into you know a bomb explosion, so as to say, one could just close it and refer the patient with the baby and with the placenta to a center. But before, of course, one is transferring, one has to ensure that where you're transferring, everything else is ready. Uh, I had a situation once, uh, you know, the similar findings like what's seen. on opening the abdomen of course i did not have to rush the patient anywhere but i had to with the open abdomen i had to wait for at least 20 minutes to ensure that the blood was ready and we had two iv lines ready before i could proceed with the upper segment cesarean and proceed with the hysterectomy so that actually those are recommended that one may have to do depending on the situation and the resources So thank you, Mina. There are two situations. Either you collect your team, call your surgeon, call your urologist, call your all nursing staff, and call uh, an aesthetic additional. And if we are not able, like Mina, I am also in the like three or third or first week of lockdown when everything was stopped, and I in emergency opened and I saw that is placenta accreta. 
I really shut because I could not like call anybody because everybody was in lockdown. So it is pay. I shifted the patient to medical college. Called the uh, HOD of the medical college that please take this case. And the patients are, matlab, had a good recovery. So don't be afraid that you have opened the abdomen, spinal, or the anesthesia has been given. If you find that there are no resources, it is always better to refer to the place with a good referral system. And secondly, or you collect your all the things. I think millions and everybody will be agreeing to this. Doctor Fardosi Begum, what's your take away on it? Uh, we will like to have that uh, either collect the all multidisciplinary unit or you shift the patient to the multidisciplinary table, uh, multidisciplinary place. Doctor uh, Doctor Fardosi, uh, your comment on it? Yeah, I, I think in my uh, experience uh, for a long time. We have dealt with quite few cases which has been transferred from lower centers and from faraway places. So that is very, we, we have congratulated them that they have taken the correct decision because they didn't have the capacity to track with these patients. This ha seldom happens, but that is an intelligent thing to do. And uh, especially in uh, also what uh, Dr. Meena said that it's not only, even if it is a tertiary center, uh, you. Um, you, you know that is the present of previous accreditor, but unless you go inside, it's very difficult to basically judge what's happening there. And depending upon the picture, you, you may need your senior colleagues or maybe colleagues to come because you need an expert assistance, few expert assistance, that is very important as well. It's not only you, not only the surgeon, the expert assistants are very important. They should be quick, they should be knowledgeable, that's what's going on, what to do. And sometimes they, guide us so well that madam this is happening so why don't you do this that is the sprouting vessel there so these are very important as well and i think we'll be coming to that point we need our urologist to bring the round i think we'll be coming to that point thank you so uh, thank you very much and, uh, and radhika now we are facing an, another nightmare that yes we have diagnosed we are planning to shift but suddenly patient started bleeding heavily so uh, at whatever system we are, we have to go for the hysterectomy. So I would like to you to give the tips to all audience. If the patient is suddenly started bleeding and we have to do the hysterectomy in a little limited setting, what uh, it, operation technique, how we should change? Uh, one uh, specific question which I found a confusing, few people say, few papers say that you should before dissect the bladder uh, below so that you have a good space before going to the hysterotomy with the classical incision and some say that you deliver the baby and then go for the hysterectomy. So uh, you please tell if the patient is bleeding and it is emergency hysterectomy actually. We are suddenly facing, we are not that equipped. So Radhika, please, uh, what you say to your resident or something, yes. I would say it is important to deliver the baby first because it gives you space to do the dissection, whatever you want to undertake. And second thing that we have not yet touched upon, something uh, which is extremely important in the meantime, you know, this is something that happens uh, once in, uh, uh, you know, every two or three months, at least in our hospital, that the patient gets referred from somewhere with torrential bleed. So the iotic compression is a huge uh, benefit if you know i think everybody should know how to do iot compression because uh, that gives you time to uh, arrange for whatever uh, things that you require you can call for help you can arrange for blood give her two iv lines and go, you know pump in a lot of fluids resuscitate her and then you start the surgery so uh, iot compression is one uh, procedure that i i would suggest every resident everybody should learn and after that having done that then you start assessing, you know, whether you should dissect the bladder first, whether you should deliver the baby first. The answer would be deliver the baby first. And after that, uh, you start dissecting, uh, you know, after uh, getting everything in place, then the first thing is to devascularize. You don't start dissecting the bladder the very first thing. It's a good idea to first achieve vascular, uh, you know, the hemostasis, devascularize the uterus first. So whether approaching the uterine artery is easier, or the internal iliac ligation is better. Probably it is internal iliac ligation because retroperitoneal space here in this situation would be easier to approach. So that is why the senior obstetricians, the people who are aware of the retroperitoneal anatomy, 
you know we need good assistance at that time and then one proceeds so uh, th that is the way i would suggest it to be thank you very much it was wonderful um, uh, radhika so your take away is that you deliver the baby so you have the space and all temporizing measures like the devascularization mm -hmm. if possible internal iliac ligation like packing uh, everything and mm -hmm. any idea about any uh, experience of any panelist with the intrauterine balloon tympanode for as a temporizing measure in uh, while the patient is bleeding and we are uh, proceeding for hysterectomy anybody has the experience of using no ma'am but we can also consider other methods no hysterectomy may not be the only one if it is a morbidly adherent placenta in one part there are other methods you know you could do a, a triple p procedure you know when you where you can remove a large chunk of the myometrium with the placenta with the placenta and that helps you to achieve hemostasis immediately then you catch the edges of the uterus and then we you know then you can decide this is one of the one conservative procedures actually but uh, in case she is bleeding from any of those big sinuses you are unable to control one could think of other processes one should be aware of the uh, you know today we have other processes available which will help you to get by time so it is a extra set of instrument conventional cesarean trolley will not help and this is the thing that we a uh, little bit about to the audience that consider extension of incision to mallord or cherney if it is trans keep patient warm consider conversion to general anesthesia expeditely close hysterectomy and proceed with hysterectomy and assess location placental invasion if possible if needed you if you feel with the ultrasound and we can consider the internal iliac artery ligation or the devascularization so uh, readily with the uh, blood component and always sometimes we need the hysterectomy so uh, i will say to dr arup to this question you want to add dr radhika has beautifully explained how to proceed for emergency hysterectomy in a very adverse situation dr arup if something is left or you want to add you please add to it the technique of the emergency hysterectomy in placenta atrita first of all uh, any placenta atrita syndrome should be diagnosed antenatally it is our target and if we cannot do so then already discussed the how to diagnose the placenta atrita syndrome and everything is ready on once you open the abdomen uh, preferably in the long vertical incision you will see there is a bulging it is already discussed an important point is that, that there will be a two channel you know alert the anesthetist for regional to convert the uh, it will be uh, to the general anesthesia and you just is uh, line of incision is very important it is not typically classical incision not the low down incision the incision will have to select above the uh, descending the above the place of the location of the placenta so that your on the incision the placenta will not come in the transfundal vertical incision a may it may give in, in the uh, posterior also then you deliver the baby then you deliver the baby and then ligate the placenta and and keep it inside and uh, repair the uh, if, if if there is uh, it is probably it is not possible to deliver the placenta at that time so you don't try to disturb the placenta to so repair the uterus very, uh, yeah. crucial uh, point which has been a very very crucial uh, with, with the all the difficulty yeah. in diagnosis or confirming map uh, what is your take away if there is a placenta possibility of placenta previa we should never do the mrp but we can be wait for the spontaneous separation of placenta yeah yeah that is important wait for spontaneous sure. if there is not possible then you will repair the uterus and then what will you do we in our practice is to do the entire routine internal leg ligation in fact in our institution all the registrars also are very expert over the routine internal leg ligation it is the so matter of practice good. Yes. Uh, One okay. thing again, a practical point that you usually after the delivery of a baby, we infuse ten unit in oxytocin in the drip. So, in suspected case of adherent placenta, will you advise the same practice? You will do the active management, or you don't do? Just wait for the physiological separation. What you say, Arup and Radhika, and every anybody, million anybody can take. You, oxytocin. you do oxytocin in the drip. Should we do in these cases or not? Should we not do? 
Sure. Now, oxytocin you can give. There is no problem. But there will be a contraction. But if there is a placenta accreta, that will not be separated uh, at all. And even the the patient physician is to give the tenexamic acid also one gram at the, at that time. Uh, and after the clamping of the cord, the tenexamic acid can be given. Whatever may be, if the placenta is, is not attached to it, can we? Yeah. my fear is that if the patient the placenta starts separating it will start in bleeding and we don't want the placenta bleeding so radhika says no yes no 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 we should uh, actually ma'am the problem is with partially separated placenta they are the ones who bleed excessively if the placenta is completely adherent you know if it is percreta increta the entire placenta if it is that way then patient will not bleed at all the problem yeah. is if some part of the placenta is morbidly morbidly adherent and the other one separates so if the uterus doesn't contract well then the patient bleeds excessively so it's always a good idea to give oxytocin okay. and let the uterus contract yes great that i also support her because i want to make a comment here because this is true because many a times uh, when the placenta is disturbed and the patient starts bleeding that's the point you need uterotonic said not only oxytocin you may need to, to give uh, like argumentin protocol sometimes to make the uterus contracted to lessen the bladder as soon as we get it and and i also uh, want to emphasize here and really thank radhika for emphasizing on aortic pressure after aortic pressure this is really uh, helpful because the patient is bleeding you need time so um, that's the pl place in uh, you can teach a junior person to Go on the left side of the patient and go on facing of the abdominal aorta. It's really by time, and um, we can manage the patient better before going shock. And the, another thing I want to emphasize: a very good anesthesiologist converting to general anesthesia. Yes. So uh, how the is there any other reason for bleeding? It's not only the breast. There may be say the patient is long time in the uh, uh, on the table, so, so the DIC is setting up maybe. So a very good anesthesiologist friend can. Did you uh, help you in that point? And I also uh, thank Doctor Aru to tell about tranexamic acid. We often forget about it, but that's a very good friend of us during when the patient is bleeding torrentially. Thank you, Madam. I will add a few more points. See, when you are tranexamic acid, definitely helps. One gram of loading dose of tranexamic acid is supposed to reduce, and it uh, it can either prevent or delay the onset of PIC if you are not prepared with the blood products. Then the other one is when you are planning for hysterectomy, I would rather advise them to put the clamp, cut it, then go ahead. Don't stitch it. As long as you are uh, putting your clamps over the uterine artery, you go ahead. You don't wait for anything. I think you can reset within two minutes. On either side, we can go up to the uterine artery. That will devascularize, and your bleeding will be less with that technique. Or we can use a bi clamp if we are uh, in possession of that. That is also a good alternative to reduce the blood. Uh, Uh, bleeding, blood loss. So actually, there are two situation. One is the patient is not bleeding when we can really plan a very good surgery and block his pregnancy. And one situation, patient is bleeding. So this is the flexibility of the surgeon's approach that when we want a very very good speed and when we want a meticulous surgery. I think uh, Ramni and Radhika will agree to it. And we are coming to a very important point of discussion. Doctor Arup is in West yeah, Bengal. Yeah, only one, one the, point. One yes. point, Sia yes, Sadna. Only ah, yes, what yes. we are noticing those cases of pattern placenta. Quite often, when we are invited or we are asked to do, go for the help, we find at many of the centers there's a lot of laceration of the myometrium because in the hurried attempt to take out that placenta, there's a lot of laceration of the myometrium and that bleeds more and sometimes so difficult. It is a ragged tear and then it's very difficult to control it. so one need to give this message to all our viewers that it's very essential as it has been told by all our panelists that suppose she is not bleeding she, one should not be in very much hurry to take out that placenta because that will give more torrential bleeding and very difficult to control keeping patience is very very important yeah you can continue yes. don't hurry don't touch the placenta if it yes. is don't touch the placenta that is the so message okay, exactly correct, correct. No, no attempt to remove the placenta the wait so for spontaneous delivery if there is no one part delivery of the panel uh, uh, this thing that in the safe reason 
actually uh, why the western world sometimes we look upon them that they have created over the times not few years ago only this six or seven years that the center of excellence for adherent placenta we have arup in west bengal where is almost very very less health expenditure radhika who is in ucms a little uh, like economically pampered in country we have fardosi begum actually this is the time as a professional and milind is in bombay sholapur which have got a good health statistics so we have the wide range of the people and as a health professional what we should want are you happy with your system that it everything we have what is needed to deal with this situation or as a professional what we should how we should cultivate these centers so this is need of time so we will take the lead from uh, dr fardosi radhika arup and as well as from uh, and the meena is in patna where the very uh, again the health quality is a big issue so we will like a little take away from the all uh, like wide uh, panelists so we will start from capital radhika then arup and all <laughs> can i before radhika can i just mention two things thank yes. you uh, number two is uh, there there is a proverb for doctors that you work so much but write very little so we are very bad at record keeping i'm sorry to say this but yes, we, yes. we work like anything but we seldom record this and we need to because if we can keep a record we learn so much number one number two we develop, uh, develop uh, data we produce data similarly the research uh, i think we we should go for some collaborative because the cases are not that much unless this is a very big institute the cases will not be uh, so big in 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 a, in a year so if we go for collaborative research that helps with this i transfer to radhika thank you i completely agree with you ma'am uh, i think you. that's a great yes. idea we uh, should all collaborate and undertake a good quality uh, trial to be able to come out with answers for the low resource settings so having said that uh, what do i want uh, with respect to the uh, infrastructure human resource and all that uh, so i think having some sort of a interventional radiology uh, available with us uh, is uh, uh, to a, to some extent of great help especially when you expect uh, you know when you have when you have an anti uh, natal diagnosis and you take her for uh, surgery then uh, there is the place of keeping the balloons in the uterine artery you deliver the baby and then uh, so that the bleeding to a large extent is reduced uh, same is the case where you want to do an expectant management where you want to leave the placenta inside then the the place for uh, uterine artery embolization so uh, that is one thing that we thought would be of use because experience with uh, uterine artery uh, balloon uh, surgery has been quite positive experience at all india institute uh, they shared their experience they said it was quite nice so other than that of course we need good anesthesiologist as is a regional blood bank so largely we do not face that kind of a problem about blood and we have experienced obstetricians and uh, we have a good support with respect to multidisciplinary team so arup are you are taking so much of placenta creta it's a uh, infrastructure human resource everything is okay or you have any coordinated meeting of among consultant that uh, like these three cases are there like dr fardosi has said really we want the sharing of experience and the research for the different methods of dealing with so arup what you say um, how is the situation in your institution my institution is a uh, tertiary center medical college uh, most important thing is i i will must stress the prepared the juniors uh, prepared the juniors that is the registered uh, for the tackling the situation and that is is actually going on because and it the experience has they have got, uh, gained the experience on seeing the cases and majority of the cases are actually diagnosed Uh, before the before the surgery and so if it is possible uh, to make the surgery at a time the day time when the senior obstetrician are present and also the anesthetist are present there and a good anesthetist present and and to prepare the uh, blood bank also and ccu facility hdu facility in also in my in my place also but so most important thing is that to prepare the resource person Uh, because yes, i have yes, no yes, idea yes, about yes, the embolism yes. 
embolization i have no idea about the arterial embolization so it is very it is, you and your experience is quite okay so actually yeah. we have to work as a team it is beyond team. our boundaries like any time any patient, patient, patient comes so that you prepare the junior particular register level junior the junior that they are ready to uh, and at present what happened in my institution they are not at all afraid of the, those patient they know and the counseling is important the hysterectomy counseling and the availability of the blood uh, that is the, that is very important and uh, that is the this is the success story in so my the, yes with so much of cesarean and so much of ivf and all thing we, our resident and the juniors has to be versed in all this and it is actually what i want to emphasize that we have to work as a coordination like we have to have the organized team meeting review case determine what at what age we are doing and that coordination and the research like meena is with the clinical research dr radhika is a, one of our key foxy and i cg expert for the evidence and everything so it is the time to take lead by professionals so that we have a scientific and integrated approach towards dealing with this condition and we have a across that discipline good interaction and a good coordination this i want to actually emphasize which is the need of the today so i think you have all covered almost what to do day before on the day it is in the center of excellence actually what the center of excellence is supposed to do one day what to do on the day what to do during surgery what to do and after surgery what to do and with the sephoc resident and with the very dedicated professional from all over country really we look forward to creating this centers of excellence uh, in a coming time this is actually one of the future plan with the top priority should be so i am just quickly going through the slide that the discussion point regional ga positioning it will be supine or dorsal lithotomy what is the incision it will be vertical or transverse and what to deliver and how to do go to the expect me sir radhika i thought you i you wish to say something uh, na you raise your finger you wish to say something no, 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 yes, so no, no, actually no, i wanted no, no, to no. add one point yes i been this is basically for the people who are working in such centers where there is no facility for second so if the if the placenta data has not been diagnosed and they have opened up there is one um, option for them that they can complete the cesarean by upper segment midline longitudinal incision close the uterus close the abdomen and then the patient can be transferred and a delayed hysterectomy can be done if the patient is not actively bleeding at yeah. that yes yes it can be done when of the some. patient is not bleeding it's very right safe and uh, it can be done in leisure period with full preparations in a tertiary care center so that is one way that the cases can be tackled if it has been missed at the time of diagnosis or anything uh, good to have dr anita singh because the discussion is getting so hot that she is also joined the panel and it is a very good for a panel and uh, uh, blood transfusion again uh, wish to it is one is to one is to one or one is to two is to four there are two recommendation and uh, what you are doing anybody can take it that what is the ratio you desire after four or five i think up to four or five it's okay Uh, but after three or four blood transfusion, what is your ratio of the blood? That is a practical point again. anybody can get mina you can take well, this yes well uh, during pregnancy uh, we know because she is losing a lot of blood normally it would be one is to one is to one but during this because uh, there are other coagulation defects also because of hemorrhage and dilutional uh, we go for four is to uh, we go for one is to one is to rather than you know four is to two is to one with otherwise we would get but here we are more uh, you know uh, uh, more uh, free about giving our other blood products uh, ffps and all and uh, usually general anesthesia is preferred and if regional anesthesia epidural catheter we first and minimize head fraction and if the surgery is more than 1 hour 1.5 hour then redose the antibiotic because sepsis is also very very important after med so this is team work matter obstetric team this is the ideal situation sometimes we can have that the obstetric team deliver the baby and goes with the baby and gynec team do all the surgery who have the skill of all the internal like iliac ligation retroperitoneal dissection and this is uh, it this can be the our deep 
uh, about a little bit about the post operative care uh, when the you had done with or you are just going to close what you want to have what Thank precaution you. and what instruction you want to give to your per operative and the post operative staff so milan can I, you take it i am when milan and ramni we are missing ramni or malin you can take it yeah, i will take it madam see once when cesarean section is over we should not relax because the problems most of the time it comes even after that we have to maintain the temperature we have to maintain the electrolyte balance and uh, invariably we have to repeat doing the pcv prothrombin time and whatever it is the platelet count periodically so that our transfusion protocol has been correct then uh, antibiotic should be as you have rightly pointed out we have to repeat antibiotic watch for hourly uh, uh, this urine output and the intake and there is still a risk of thromboembolism in patients who have been uh, having had this uh, lot of transfusion problems and we have to take care the, take care of that then when you are giving massive transfusion protocol you have to think about the trolley that is the uh, transfusion induced acute lung injury we have to think about and uh, we should not uh, you always try to maintain the um, uh, uh, temperature that is very very important hypothermia should be avoided and then you still if the patient has been in uh, hypotension for quite some time there is a chance that renal perfusion can do, go down you have to keep a watch over the renal function test also and if she is uh, still uh, getting um, uh, worsen the chances for uh, multi organ failure lung failure hepatic failure and so so many things they can happen and uh, so it really needs a multidisciplinary team and a intensive with to monitor our whole uh, post operative care so that is the thing the story is not over with a well done hysterectomy patient can have anything dic renal failure organ injury multiple organ failure and we have to deal with the very good communication with the resident staff that what is going and what is we are expecting in the next few hours patient is going to bleed or not going to bleed how to keep warm and a good and i i uh, maternal icu care these are the patient which really want icu care if we really want to save these patient so uh, for sefog madam for dosi begum already said that uh, we are too we think that we are too busy and we cannot like develop these centers of excellence but actually we have to develop if we want to save the mothers a little bit we are finishing in the last time of the panel that costly everybody says about the costly technology so for sefog we want organized team or costly technology a quick rapid fire it is that heavy work does not spare us for like spoiling our responsibility for making the center of excellence so um, arup you do urethral catheterization in all patient or only few how far you have find useful the urethral catheterization be very very quick to these answers yes in fact we are not practiced with during so, the urethral catheterization <laughs> so the no, world no. also says it is <laughs> not needed but <laughs> just you have to make available of three way folic catheter and urethral stent so in case you want to take as the integrity of urinary tract they are available they are available in ot but routine yeah. stenting is not stenting is not right. done not and it is also uh, it is not recommended also it is yes. not recommended uh, a second thing is that dr radhika has mentioned a lot about the pre operative intra arterial catheters and balloons so dr radhika seems delhi and says that they are very effective uh, are you using it uh, dr arup in your institution and we no, 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 not doctor, at all no at all and dr no. fardosi begum in your peak institution it is available or not i think she is muted yeah yeah the, the level of uh, hospital i am working we have very good facility and we have very high tech uh, anesthesia is this because the institution i work is a bardem is the uh, bangladesh institute for research and rehabilitation including diabetes metabolic diseases so it's a um 800 bedded hospital huge hospital with multidisciplinary approaches so we have everything there including good uh, blood transfusion services that's really good thing is yeah yes. Yes, yes, i'm yes. fortunate enough that at, at, i am working in a very good environment but still there it's not only the i was just writing about the uh, 
uh, sort of uh, final comments. So one of them is having a very good checklist sort of thing, you know, for developing our uh, Dr. Arupa stating that we need to prepare our juniors. So it's, it's like if we have that, if it is a case of pass, these this, this things have, have to be done. You have to inform the urologist, you have to do this and that. And there's a need for massive drug transfusion. If, if, if there are two blood ready, there may be uh, four donors ready. So these things are very important as well. The teamwork and um, also uh, the uh, uh, techniques that uh, when you are waiting for someone, what you are going to do that, to make the patient survive and all this. Here I see one point is about the balloon catheterization. I think um, Bangladesh is very advanced in, the, in this and we have successfully could train lots of our doctors. Even our very junior doctors can do this. And um, in case of torrential bleeding, sometimes this helps. You know, uh, uh, as a, a placenta previa case, there was a mild progress, partially separated, but the patient is bleeding. So in that case, this is a very good technique as well. And we have, we have served lot, lots of patients with this, this method. And Julia should be rampant to do, do this because, uh, and and on one of the thing is keeping the condoms ready in the, uh, so that, that's how I told that there should be a very good checklist sort of thing so that everything is at hand when you need these things. Thank you. So that's very, very important that the checklist and the availability of the simple things. A little a word about the balloon catheterization, arterial embolization, still the world does not say anything much for favor of it. They, we cannot predict that this patient is going to benefit it or this patient is not going to have the benefit. So it is a big question mark on it and still we have to depend upon diagnostic and the operative skill and our organized team, not on the many high technology. Lastly, conservatives like Dr. Radhika says, triple P procedure, focal accreta, uh, uh, any million uh, you are taking, you say, with a good result, in what situation you want to do the conservative management of placenta Yeah, yeah. See, uh, basically two points here I want to emphasize upon. As we were telling about this post-op care, quite often we are so much worried of this hypovolemia and hemorrhage. Many of patients may end up with the uh, pulmonary edema because of the overloading as well. Yes. That is the same thing. And the same case with the hysterectomy. Sometimes we are in so much of hurry because we get so much frightened with that adrenal placenta that we think of only hysterectomy. And that's not true. Quite often, we can conserve the uterus as well. We'll have to individualize that particular scenario and accordingly go ahead. For example, a very uh, interesting joke at this particular moment, we delivered a similar case where we could conserve the uterus. And the aunt of that patient who is gynecologist sitting in Karnataka was all the time saying, it's just impossible that uterus is saved. It's just impossible that uterus is saved. And you know, she was all the time the patient was asking me, uterus must have been removed. And I said, no, I could conserve. So all these extremes can happen. So one need to take into consideration that part as well. One need not immediately start putting clamps. At the same time, taking post-op care also, one has to be very vigilant as far as her, uh, the arterial pressure is concerned. So one thing actually what we want, uh, one thing is that the people are forcing you to conserve the uterus. One is that you deliberately taking a medical decision to conserve the uterus and take uh, some like risk for them. So what's your take away that, uh, in Arup, I will say to you, in what patient you want to take the, this thing? Uh, you want to do the conservative approach for the adherent placenta. How you select the patient? Uh, in fact, uh, when there is a placenta is partially adherent, right? there, is a, there are two types of management actually. One is the conservative and another is the expectant management. Expectant means the, you close the uterus and keep uh, as it is and automatically that will be autolyzed. That is the expectant management. Another thing is the conservative surgery. Conservative management is the keep, keeping the fertility. So you can do you partial if the placenta is partially separated or it is depth is less, where there is the depth is less and is the focal, focal placenta there, you can do the conservative surgery there. Partially and also uh, probably the Ramani, Ramani, Dr. Ramani has said about the junk of myoma, junk of myometrium you can remove with the, with the placenta and then repair. That that can be that can be done. 
but there is a problem is that there are future sepsis and after the conservative surgery and uh, dr fidosi has uh, uh, rightly said there is a tamponet actually the balloon tamponet you can give balloon so, uh, either stitches or balloon tamponet or the condom tamponet you can give inside the uterus like which is done in the placenta previa so normally that is from that the we have to sum up the panel and two thing what i want to message that methotrexet has not been proven effective after conservative treatment not, not at it all can have that toxicity not. and beta scg monitoring does not help for monitoring so and the, how do we monitor after conservative only by serial ultrasound and if needed sometimes the mri so no beta scg monitoring is going to help and methotrexet is not going to help so focal mm -hmm. accreta and the fundal and posterior adherent placenta are the patient where the conservative management sometime help what happened in the fundal it is not placenta previa fundal posterior adherent placenta uterus gets contracted and sometimes the bleeding gets okay and in focal accreta either you can oversee or you can do and block resection placenta with the uterus and then repair so it is very very select question uh, 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 like category where we can apply conservative surgery and we have to make very good counseling for all potential complication as well as the need of hysterectomy that is from 30 to 67% so it is a risky thing and we have to have a very close monitoring for hemorrhage sepsis dic iu av mol formation and with this thing triple p is the perioperative location of placenta followed by pelvic disc devascularization with the placental non separation with myometrial axis and what the triple p which is being done at some places so we have to save lives everywhere and we have to in south asia we have to be very very careful about counseling because patient are paying out of their own pocket and we are not having that streamlined system and that is the need for it so how it is the final slide how we should final take away for the south asia we have to reduce primary cesarean section rate and promote vaginal delivery but how a good vaginal delivery needs more health system stress in handling and the quality of critical care and it is our debt of our women to politics as well as medical health care system only with a good system we can reduce the primary cesarean section rate as well so thank you very much for discussion thank you meena for this like we are together in this program and the uh, world has the difficult question but the answers are very very simple i think every panelist uh, from the core of my heart for a wonderful discussion and all the audience who are and like listening and who are with this in this uh, in this 45 to 50 minutes thank you and thank you very much sadhna as well for moderating so well because in given time these topics are so difficult to cover but we could you know reach to maximum potential of it thank you very much sadhna thank you sadhna madam and all the brilliant panelists for this wonderful panel discussion now we move on to the next session that alka di will present her paper on cesarean scar pregnancy so i request dr alka pande madam to please share your slides yes ma'am yes ma'am just sharing dr anita singh madam has already introduced alka di so just alka di start the presentation over to you alka di alka di can please your self thank you sir yeah mr jignesh please unmute alka madam i have tried from here but i guess ah yeah. yeah it's okay Yes, Doctor Alka, you can speak now. You are unmuted.
She's speaking, but we cannot hear her somehow. Maybe she can connect through the phone. She can do the presentation through the phone instead of the computer. No, if there is a connection problem. Nina, तो वो X anemia का presentation ले सकते हैं अगर if there is delay because it is a short presentation ना Nina. Yes, Doctor Mina. No, what is happening with Doctor? Doctor Mina, please take this presentation. Doctor Doctor Alka को phone से. She is unable to present. She is unable to connect. So please you take this presentation. Okay. Which presentation, ma'am? Shang. Ah. Anemia presentation. Shall I yes, start? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You have it. Just, just. Yeah. Mr. Amit, do you have presentation of Alka with you? Yes, madam. Yes, ma'am. I yes, ma I asked Meena to present Alka with presentation. I require the screen, and she will be talking from the phone. That will do. Okay. Okay. So. Alka, these present. Yes, Anita, ma'am. Yes. No, no, okay. you will have to present this paper. Me? No, no. What is happening, Alka? She will be. She is not connected. Yeah, what? yeah. This is the reason. Did she tell you? Hello. Amita, has Ask Alka the asked you? Yeah, she asked me to present this paper. Then you present. You, you, you present. Okay, on behalf of Dr. Alka Pandey, I would briefly like to speak on uh, uh, scar pregnancy. Uh, we have covered some part of it already, and we know it was first described in 1978 by Larson and Solomon. Next slide, please. No, as the incidence of uh, 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 like uh, cesarean scar, uh, uh, pregnancy is increasing, cesarean delivery is increasing. so also the cesarean scar pregnancy and uh, the number of cesarean sections increases in a patient the chances of uh, cesarean scar pregnancy increases and also um, uh, there could be recurrence so also we know that we are having a very good ultrasound these days we are doing a lot of ultrasounds awareness is increased so the number of uh, placenta uh, scar pregnancy uh, is also being diagnosed more not only is it being Occurring more, it is also being diagnosed more. Next, next, please. So, like acrita, it could also occur wherever there has been a, a trauma. Wherever there is a scar niche, it could occur. Next slide. So we know because of this uh, uh, disruption, the invasion by the implanting blastocysts through the microscopic tracts that develop from the trauma. of an earlier scar uh, next slide so it could be also secondary to systemic disease uh, while like in diabetes where there is poor blood supply and uh, poor tissue quality and improper closure has been there next slide so in fact that is another reason why a single layer closure is being discouraged now now history of amenorrhea followed by bleeding is the clinical diagnosis when she is we think it could be a missed or a you know threaten abortion it could as well be a scar pregnancy so a positive pregnancy test and a bleeding a previous scar we should always keep in mind that it could be a scar pregnancy also so uh, next slide so with that suspicion in mind we go for an ultrasound wherein we would um, see a pregnant a sac which is lower down into the uterus especially if we've done a first trimester like it was already discussed in the uh, during the uh, uh, panel discussion and uh, if it is within the scar it could be uh, the shape would be maybe a little triangular and when you press it doesn't slide down what we call the Uh, sliding uh, sign of a uh, abortion, uh, and uh, the myometrium would be all around the sac, and it would be thinned out. So a trans vaginal or a trans abdominal, or maybe both of the two. Next slide. कोई पता नहीं कैसे करते. Next, next, next. नीना बोल रही है. So trans three uh, D ultrasound scans, and sometimes MRI is an adjunct to it. And again, those same findings that we've described. 
and Akrita would be there. Uh, and also, you know, okay, now uh, this is another hysteroscopic diagnosis where for a threatened or, uh, you know, a complete or abnormal uterine bleeding, you go and then you see there is a defect at the site of the scar and you can see the villi there. Next, next. So this is the laparoscopic picture. We know the scar pregnancy could be, you know, the endophytic type where it's going in, uh, growing inside towards the uterus, or it could be growing towards the peritoneum serosa. So when it is more towards the outer side, this is what the how the picture would lo look like. Next slide. So that is what the classification says. Type 1 is endogenic, where implantation occurs on the scar, and the sac grows towards the cervical isthmic or the uterine cavity. Type 2 is exogenic, where it, when the gestational sac is deeply embedded in the scar and surrounding myometrium and grows towards the bladder. Next slide. So uh, this is what it is showing, the type 1 and the type 2. Next slide. So the myometrial layer between the gestational sac and the bladder becomes very thin and it may even disappear with the bulging of the gestational sac through the gap as the pregnancy advances. And two thir in two thirds of the cases, thickness of the scar may be less than five millimeters. So a clinical presentation, she may be asymptomatic and when you do the ultrasound, you may find it. There may be painless vaginal bleeding in 39% or general abdo abdominal pain in 25%. Next slide. So again, differential diagnosis, would that be of, you know, impending miscarriage? The gestational sac is often irregular, located within the uterine cavity with absent or minimal color flow Close. Gentle pressure at the level of internal loss may displace the sac. That is the sliding sign, uh, which happens in an um, uh, abortion case. Then, of course, you have to differentiate it from the cervical, uh, this thing. So uh, ultrasound would show empty cervix and an empty uterine cavity. And the sac somewhere at the level of the previous scar at the internal, uh, at the level of isthmus, more towards the uterine wall and a good fl color flow Doppler and a negative sliding sli sign. Next slide. Yeah. This is Now the management would depend on the presentation, patient factors, what is the symptomatology, whether she's completed a pregnancy, whether she want, uh, want, wishes fertility, acceptability of prolonged follow-up, associated lesions, surgical risk factors in response to the initial treatment. Next slide. So uh, here again, like we mentioned, uh, uh, you know, counseling the patient is important. What is the gestational age? What are the beta HCG level, the size, whether the fetal heartbeat is present, the myometrial thickness, viability. So, and whether you have the facility of interventional radiology, what is the surgical expertise and facilities and the monitoring. So all the next slide. So all these, is, uh, these factors are going to decide what we need to do. Or, uh, so, uh, so there's no consensus. We have to individualize the management according to the patient and the presentation. And uh, like it is an ectopic in a way, so all treatments carry risk of hemorrhage and subsequent hysterectomy. It has to be individualized and pregnancy should be ended as soon as possible after com uh, confirming the diagnosis. Next, of course, with exception, if, uh, if it is more towards uh, the uterus and it, uh, the baby is alive and it's continuing to grow. Uh, so expectant management, very rarely in selected cases, they should be uh, stable, thoroughly counseled, close monitoring, minimal symptoms, and uh, patient is compliant. In type 1 only, declining beta HCG and no fetal cardiac activity. Next slide. And medical management, again, could be for some selected patients where beta HCG is uh, less than 5,000 international units, maybe up to 12,000. Uh, a patient is up, uh, uh, stable with no cardiac activity and myometrial thickness between the bladder and the sac is, uh, it is actually 1,200. Okay. Gestational sac is more than 2 millimeters. So uh, like in other ectopic, uh, the, it would be a single dose of methotrexate. Next slide. Next, next slide. And some people prefer to go give both system, systemic and also a local methotrexate. 
other could be surgical dilatation and surgical evacuation some would uh, would like to go for hysteroscopic resection if patient has not especially if the patient has not responded to dial, uh, dnc vaginal excision and resuturing is another option available laparoscopic excision and resuturing open excision and resuturing and a combined uh, laparoscopic and hysteroscopic procedure combined laparoscopic and vaginal surgery and sometimes hysterectomy especially if the patient has completed her family so it could also be a combined of sequential management you try an artery embolization or chemo embolization followed by dilatation and evacuation surgical resection in 24 to 48 hours methotrexate followed by surgical evacuation or resection after an interval so we have all a whole range and we could individualize which to do depending on the situation uh next slide of course we would like to give antibiotics so this is intrauterine balloon catheter to compress the uh, gestational sac and also sometimes to control the bleeding next slide Uh, so here again, once we've gone for uh, the treatment, avoid pregnancy for 12 to 24 months. Surgical repair of uterine scar defects with single or double layer. Next slide. So again, uh, one thing I would like to hear, as we've already discussed, then some of these cesarean scar pregnancies left alone, they could grow, especially the endophytic ones. They could grow on to be, uh, to you know, uh, with the viable pregnancy. Only uh, most of them, in fact, maybe all of them, uh, if they continue, they would uh, uh, go on to have placenta accreta if, if they diagnose them actually truly as a, a cesarean scar pregnancy. So incidence is again rising and uh, because of morbid, morbidly adherent placenta, we should n uh, do not confuse cesarean scar pregnancy with ectopic pregnancy. Early diagnosis is important. TVS is the most effective and preferred diagnostic tool and we need to be sure whether the heart activity is present or not. Next slide. So if heart activity is docu uh, documented, we have to counsel the patient. Um, uh, regarding the final outcome of such a pregnancy, inform the patient of the risk of pregnancy continuation. If continuation and additional counseling session, risk should be explained. If termination, a reliable treatment that stops fetal heartbeat without delay. Next slide. Avoid single treatment as they are unlikely to be effective. We may have to give DNCs, uh, do give single uh, dose of methotrexate, which is, could be intra myometrial or into the sac, removal of ectopic scar by any of the methods, hysteroscopy, laparoscopy, laparotomy, uh, vaginally and resuturing of the scar. Uh, next slide. So consider combination, best result, direct injection with methotrexate or KCL into gestational sac and with transvaginal uh, guidance. Um, then in next uh, pregnancy and early you know, follow-up, and complications could, of course, be placenta previa and accreta, uterine rupture, massive hemorrhage, with an increased maternal morbidity and mortality. Uh, and that is why it's a, uh, we are scared of this condition. And uh, I think most of us keep encountering off and on such a condition. So we have to keep an open eye for this condition. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meena, for taking this presentation and handling this emergency situation. Thank you so much. Once again, I request you to present your paper on fresh thinking on anemia. So please go through your presentation. I know you. I, I must. It be, must be an overdose of me, but uh, this is important because it is the uh, slides by the company, and uh, we are thankful to them for sponsoring our uh, um, this thing, our session. So I, uh, you know, anemia is such a age-old problem, but we have to keep thinking afresh. Next slide. So this is actually the incidence with one, almost 2 billion people, you know, um, uh, suffering from this condition, 27% of the population globally. But when we talk about our own part of the country, uh, in reproductive age group, it would be around 43, with almost 4% being severely anemic. Next slide. 
so uh, you know again this is the same slide showing how the incidence is pretty significantly high and it continues to be a very important condition next slide uh, you know uh, contributing to a lot of direct maternal mortality and also indirectly so uh, these are the various uh, clinical uh, features that patient could present with increase so in reproductive age group increase hospitalization decrease quality of life in menstruating women if it is uh, abnormal uterine bleeding increase risk of preterm delivery with low neonatal weight perinatal complications newborn and maternal mortality in pregnancy next slide so uh, now the fresh thinking is about the you know the treatment part we know about the diet uh, what to eat how to eat uh, and all that uh, and still sometimes because of various reasons patient would be anemic we have to think about other lifestyle measurements the um, the deworming part and uh, the simple oral iron formulations in spite of all that there are times when patient would need iv iron formulations so what we have is the ferric you know a, a preparation which is actually not very new now it's been there for some time and we all have uh, you know experience in using ferric carboxy maltose preparation so there are you know uh, it is we know that it is not associated with hyper type 1 type of hypersensitivity reaction what we have been seeing with dextran and it can be you know a large dose up to 1 gram 1000 mg could be given in a short period 15 to 30 uh, minutes so uh, even though we are giving a large dose but it is because tightly bound to the uh, carbohydrate uh, you know the core and it is released very slowly and also because it has a similar structure to ferritin it gets easily deposited in the re cells and thereby it, it will not cause toxicity of the iron and the oxidative stress and it will continue uh, to be released in small amounts so we have the advantage the patient has the advantage a single dose in a short period of time and you know uh, they have it uh, and the, the uh, uh, the non compliance is not there the side effects are not there so uh, so here this is the repetition of what all i have said it has a high, longer half life of 16 hours ph is near neutral it is isotonic low antigenicity no test dose is required and the time of injection uh, would be around 15 minutes to 30 minutes for a 1000 gram milligram dose and maximum dose per infusion is 1000 milligram next slide so mostly we are using it in postpartum anemia wherein the patient goes home so uh, even if she is coming to us after 6 weeks we know she is taking a full dose of iron and we can follow her up in the uh, postpartum visit to see how she has responded to our uh, dose Uh, and also uh, abnormal uterine bleeding is a very important condition which makes the patient you know our quality of life decreases because of anemia so while we are controlling the cause of uh, we can build up the patient by iv iron and because uh, the uh, next slide because she responds early within few minutes a few weeks she would be actually you know uh, uh, ready for whatever if she were building her up for her uh, uh, um, operation or otherwise uh, also uh, she would be much better off with this uh, because uh, early recovery is there uh, next slide so this slide actually shows uh, the time response how it is a better response in a shorter period of time next slide next slide uh, next slide actually i would just actually uh, here the, what they are trying to show in various you know the published data uh, that it not only corrects the anemia uh, uh, as compared to oral preparations uh, which is significantly higher but also the you know the uh, storage part the uh, the ferric uh, ferritin level is also much much improved in both mohit next, next slide 
So both were significantly uh, improved. Uh, so this is another study, a retrospective study with 214 patients, <clears throat> where they have looked at both uh, the uh, hemoglobin level and the serum ferritin, which both improved in a period of six weeks. Next slide. And of course, with the, uh, you know, uh, the advantage of not having these uh, um, uh, side effects and a good, uh, a, a better, although no difficulty about the compliance. So what we can say that um, it is safe. And uh, so these are various studies telling us about the same, how in iron deficiency anemia, uh, where we could avoid a blood transfusion at the same rate, uh, at the same time, ensuring that patient gets the required iron. Next slide. Next slide. So to summarize, the structural differences between IV compounds greatly influences safety profile, feasibility, and cost of the treatment forces. Uh, ferric carboxymaltose allows higher dose administration, which is more convenient. The patient pure venous punctures, less time off work, etc. And the healthcare system, so you don't have to go to the hospital every now and then. I think to, uh, in today's COVID time, that can be even more important, relevant. And extensive clinical evidence is available for FCM and various indications like postpartum anemia, uh, abnormal uterine bleeding, perioperative anemia, anemia of chronic diseases. We know in chronic anemia diseases where a patient is not absorbing a lot of iron because of, uh, you know, hepcidin increase. So there again, an IV iron would bypass that condition. I think I've completed this. Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank, yes, ma thank, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the patience. Thank you, for a very nice presentation. I know there is overdose of lectures on you, but we have some antidote or you can say another overdose in the form of question answer session. Are you ready for that? So let's start no, with your answer patient. session. <laughs> but we could not see the audience, the numbers and all that. Is it how, how what was the attendance? We have like? different link for that, madam. Okay. So, we have 592, uh, 90, 592 uh, participants. Did they enjoy the same? Because usually we get the feedback, no? Today we didn't even see the chat yeah, box. Uh, that type of feedback we have not received. Yeah, actually, but we have received <laughs> few questions. Okay. Oh, actually, 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 yeah, yeah, actually that, that feedback. Okay, one doctor wants to know, Adam, she has given four uh, questions yeah. together. She wants to know that before referring, if she wants to refer closing abdomen in and mass closure, does it mean all layers together? Yes or no? This is her first question. If you refer the patient with closing abdomen in and mass, is it should be done in all layers together or, or in different layers? All layers together. Or layers together. Her another question is: Is there any role of cauterizing the be bed of placenta? The same doctor wants to know: Is there any role of cauterizing the bed of placenta? No, this is bed of placenta after removal, before removal. You know what is she exactly wanting to know? Because after delivery, they are dilated sinuses. So people talk about various types of stitches which can be applied to close those no. sinuses. So, uh, the pottery really has no role to play. Not in chain closure. She is talking of abdominal closure. No, no. She has written. She is talking about the placental bed use of pottery bed. Placenta. She has written this question. Okay. Her third part of her question is applying a tonic weight in lower segment reduces blood loss and saves time for hysterectomy in case of pass. So, ma'am, I request you or authorities to tell so many single-handed practitioners how to do it quickly if they are picked up in such situation. What to do? I think Pangu was all about it only. <laughs> yes, so yes, yes, madam. Most of the answers... We plan the, our system before. Don't switch to the hysterectomy. Like, collect everybody, then you deliver by fundal incision, and then you go to the hysterectomy. So, some way in the... Placing tonica in the placenta previa anterior and the adherent, I think it will be very difficult and we have to go step by step. And dangerous because you see the uterine tissue is going to be friable. 
so you start tying up things there it's going to worsen the situation it's not a good idea to use a tunica uh, in the lower uterine segment in a low lying placenta with morbidly adherent placenta no thank you thank you madam uh, one other doctor has want uh, she has written surgical management in a previous cesarean section with placenta previa and, and acreta how to manage this question is not clear to me I think actually, you have covered the question in our presentation. It was present. has been done. In the fine detail, actually, this has been covered. Most of the answers have been this has been answered only. Yes, ma'am. She... Most of the answers have been given during the course of lecture and panel discussion. And they are recording the session. I think they can share the link. They can people. Yeah, can... exactly. People who have doubts yeah, yeah, can go sure. to the. There is one important sure, question. What will be the condition for another pregnancy after the placenta accreta? If you have done the conservative management, it is almost it is one of the high risk factor. If you have done conservative management in previous pregnancy, there is very very high incidence of repeat placenta accreta, and yeah. then again first is the accreta, then of course with what I said with the uterine embolization or this thing we have done, then there is a more possibility of secondary infertility as well as all the growth disorder. Beside having again adherent placenta. Yes. What are the ways we can decrease the incidence of placenta accreta in the present context? Uh, first is we have to reduce the primary. It was answered already. <laughs> and reduce the <laughs> unindicated surgery like where too much endometrial ablation, a non-diagnosed septum, but we are removing septum in the so many. So unnecessary surgery, more uh, choice of the medical termination of surgery rather than the surgical method in first and second. Like uh, quite often we find nowadays whenever people they put hysteroscope, they always want to resect the lateral walls and they say that yes. they want to you know, expand uterine cavity, which need to be you know, properly addressed. Because that is one of the cause. Unnecessary, we are uh, inviting the morbid agents bit by doing that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Amita, maybe you can filter the questions. No, name is not what, written. Center is not written. No, no, only no, questions you know, are here. Just filter out some important questions. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. only, but only we have seven questions. Okay. We took it. So and we don't have questions. One more question, ma'am. One more question, I should. Well, okay. Uh, who abdominal incision for acreta? We should give. I think we have done it. It can be the, if it is transverse, then the male lord incision, then we cut the rectal sheath and extend the journeys. Or we can do the vertical and uh, intramical incision. So both ways are because we don't, the aim is uh, the good exposure. So that is the needed. If you can do the transverse, you can extend it with the journeys or the male lord by cutting the rectus muscles. Or you can do, you are not comfortable, then you can do the can I just add a comment to that, Dr. Amita? Uh, yes. so once you undertake an ultrasound in the antenatal period, you do the placental mapping and look for the upper limit of the placenta, you know, the extent to which yes. it is there. Yes. So in case it is quite high up, it's not a good idea then to go through a finance steel incision or a transverse incision. Mm -hmm. So then that would be a situation to use a vertical incision. Whereas if it is a low-lying placenta, a central placenta, well below the umbilicus, you know, just in the suprapubic, one can even consider a high transverse incision on the abdominal wall. So uh, one could tailor it accordingly, according to the antenatal diagnosis also. Sure. One more question is there. How early placenta accreta to be detected? You have answered very well in your paper, but again, how early placenta accreta to be detected? Uh, in the first trimester itself, uh, you know, when we have the suspicion, we all are doing a first trimester scan, the NT scan. At that time, especially if it has been done before 13 weeks when the uterine cavity is not full, and we find that this, uh, uh, the upper segment there is empty, the lower, it's there in the lower segment, and uh, near the uterine scar, uh, then uh, we have a strong suspicion. At that time also, we can see the lacunies and we can see a thin myometrium, uh, myometrial ring. So those are the indicators. So about in first trimester also, you can get about 30 to 40% yes. detection if one is careful and looking for it. Okay. Thank you. I think all the questions have been answered right now. So, but once Madam, Sadhana Madam told that whenever we talk about past, story never ends. 
सो अगेन फॉर टूडे सी एम ई कहानी अभी और बाकी है ऑन द बिहाफ ऑफ क्लिनिकल रिसर्च कमिटी आई हैव टू प्रपोज वोट ऑफ थैंक्स सो जस्ट आई विल टेक
for using single layer or double layer and one thing i got that as we are doing it should not there should be actually we are doing continuous suturing but there was a comment that it is better to do in intermittent suturing that leads to a better scar but we don't have any experience of intermittent suturing of uh, uterine wall so uh, you, and i agree with um, i agree with radhika that it is possible that last 20 years everybody is using non absorbable sutures and maybe just because delayed, of that delayed episode delayed delayed, delayed. 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 Yes, we clear most of people. Most of us are using. That might be one of the reasons. That thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is why I my question. <laughs> But there Thank is no that public yeah. support. The support that the bike leader. Uh, no. That's why Radhika. That's why Radhika can give her comment on that because yeah. she has. Yeah. Can I can I say on that? See, basically okay. we have seen that era. We have used catgut as well in early days of our practice. And we also use the vicryl as well uh, now actually as a routine. But what matters more actually are the ascipses. That is very important. Your technique of suturing. Both these things are more important as far as the uterine uh, integrity is con concerned. But it all depends again from patient to patient. That's very true. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now we came to the end of session as the vendor has another event from six o'clock. So oh, okay. let me take the opportunity <laughs> to thank you everyone on behalf of Foxy Clinical Research Committee and the FOG. At the outset, I would like to thank our respected president, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi sir, for giving us permission to conduct this meeting. My sincere thanks to CFOG president, Madam Dr. Firdaus Begum. for her active participation as a chairperson as well as as a panelist i extend my heartiest thanks to dr anita singh madam vice president foxy from core of my heart for her presence in this international webinar and participating so actively madam you made all bihari very proud <laughs> i extend my thanks to dr sadhana gupta and dr meena samant for their hard work in organizing this cme they are instrumental for this cme i thank dr ag radhika and again dr meena samant for their brilliant papers as usual you both are combination alka. of passion and perfection let's not forget alka di who yes, did yes, the hard work of no 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 i am going to say I thank Dr. Alka Pandey, Madam, for her for her pre preparing this presentation for such a long time. She tried hard to come on line, but due to, unfortunately she could not come. She shared her presentation and asked her to present it. So I am very sorry for her. Again, we will we would love to listen to her in next CME. So my heartiest thanks to Alka Pandey, Madam. What to say about panelists? They all performed very well. My heartfelt thanks to. madam fardos fardosi begum madam ramni devi madam milin sir arup maji sir uh, dr radhika meena for wonderful discussion and most of, i congratulate uh, from my heart to sadhana gupta madam to making mm -hmm. to make it so wonderful and interesting how can i forget to thank our academic partner mcure mr amit and his team for their hard work and for giving their technical support throughout uh, this arrangement once again thank you all and thank you dr amita you conducted the entire session very very, yes, very thank nice you. thank you thank you so much most <laughs> amita was very appreciated. graceful comparing i must say that yeah and compliment to radhika as well for her wonderful house yes. <laughs> Incidentally, <laughs> 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 this oh. is a virtual Sorry. background. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask you whether it is virtual or is it a house. <laughs> it's, it's a virtual uh, background for uh, Zoom. Yes. Oh. Go, got oh. it. Oh. No, I, I oh. want to oh. ask that, but not for this. That we be underestimating someone. So, thank you. Another problem. I have to take an exam again now. So, thank you so much. Thanks so I need to start with this. Also, Foxy representative. And can I ask yes, Sanna to please uh, share that uh, uh, pass register format with us? Uh, Sanna, can you? I think Radhika told about it. Uh, register. I talked about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Can I hear you, ma'am? Can you say that again? The uh, the placenta accreditor register you are maintaining something. 
registry. Yeah, the registry. Yes. It is basically a registry. A registry. Okay. So, so uh, I'm, uh, now can you share the format, please? The format. Okay, the form. we, we are just in the process of analyzing it. Once we are yeah, yeah, the yeah. formalities, so then we will as, as much as possible, then we can basically have this. Um, uh, Certainly, discussion. I will do that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. until Sadhana, I, I yes, need to I will coordinate with the. We can work on it. Thank you. Congratulations for this. Thank you. So I I said bye to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because it was really great to see you once again. Good. Pleasure to have you. Yeah. It was really wonderful to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.